Right, good evening everyone and welcome to this meeting of the Local Liaison Forum for the Milton Road Project. here to introduce themselves and I'm sure that others will be coming when their prior meetings allow them to be here at six. But perhaps if we start with Michael uh, Page. If you, um, okay, so Michael Page, Chair of the Perth Park Estate Residents Association. Charles Nisbet, Chair of the Milton Road Residents Association. Uh, Jocelyn Scott, I'm the County Councillor for Arbury and Chair of the Local Liaison Forum for Milton Road Project. Uh, Councillor Jerry Bird, I'm the um, Councillor for East Chesterton and I'm the Vice Chair of the Local Liaison Forum. Claire Richards, County Councillor for Castle Ward. Mike Sargent, City Councillor for West Chesterton. Elisa Moschini, um, County Councillor for King's Edges. Uh, Kevin Price, City Councillor for King's Edges. Martin Scott, City Councillor for King's Edges. Marjorie Owen, City Councillor for East Chesterton. <laughs> <laughs> and we have our scribes and, and our uh, complement of officers. Um, well, um, as I've said, are, are there any apologies that I should take? Has anybody noted any apologies? No. Oh, Peter Saras, Councillor Peter Saras is in the middle of marking. Right, and you have. <laughs> oh, Ma Michael Bond has also apologised. Do you say, uh, Councillor? I don't think about it, looking for No, I, I tend to think often Councillor Manning comes, but comes late. He hasn't contacted me. So it's Councillor Peter Saras from the city. It's um, Michael Bond. And uh, now it's my turn for an update. Um, I'll be very brief in my update because we really must concentrate on what we're here for this evening. I will simply say that at the last meeting of the Local Liaison Forum, um, Chris Tunstall, who's here standing behind me, uh, introduced himself as he was new to the project and uh, from the point of view of coming to a liaison meeting and made it very clear that what is, was being modelled was the do optimum plan that had been put forward by this local liaison forum. Do something and do maximum were out, absolutely out the window, out the door, however one wants to describe it. In Australia, we would say down the gurgler, which I don't think is an expression that's used here. <laughs> but if that means put. And what is now up here on the screen is do optimum with the modifications that the officers believe are necessary. Now, when I say modifications they believe are necessary, people need to look at what's being said here to understand absolutely that there's no doubt that do optimum is the premier issue here and that if there are concerns about modifications, then we need to have them articulated and we'll, if we need to, fight back against the officers. But the point is, it's do optimum that's the basis. Um, the second uh, of my updates I wish to give is that there were questions that were asked at the last local liaison forum and they were put in writing. We responded to those and I distributed them to the uh, residents associations and I believe they distributed them wider and if people would like 
the responses in writing to those questions and I'm very happy to forward them to whoever wishes that. And then the next point I need to make is that there was a concern in the questions about the July Assembly and board meetings and how it would be possible to deal with an extensive agenda at those meetings and give proper attention to our concern, which is Milton Road. Both the Assembly and the board have extended their meetings so they take up the whole day. And Milton Road project will be substantially a half a day of that. The other issues will be noted in the afternoon and we will have our Milton Road forum um, our Milton, yes, our Milton Road Forum resolutions dealt with by the Assembly and by the Board so that they're in a position to respond effectively and so that we know what their response is and to discuss it properly. Um, the second point on this is that there will of course be a chance, an opportunity for questions. But there is, uh, I do have a, um, an outline of how the question are handled by the Assembly and the Board and I'm happy to make copies of this available to everybody here. Um, <coughs> that the point is, and I'll run through quickly, deadline for sending public questions is 10am three days before the Assembly and three days before the Board. Um, questions are sent to the Democratic Services team and questioners are asked to limit their questions to no more than 300 words maximum so that there can be a really meaningful response to them. And because there is, although we're taking the whole of the morning uh, for Milton Road, there is therefore a limit in time. And I would just ask all of you who do want to ask questions at that, those meetings to please think about whether you can, if you're, there are a doubling up of questions, can you get together and make sure that instead of having 52 questions, for example, if it's possible to amalgamate questions in some way, that means that there's more opportunity for a meaningful response from the board in their focus on our do optimum and it's being put to the board in our resolutions. So having said all that, um, I would now like to ask if there are any questions at this stage, um, but can we make them brief so that we can get on with the purpose of the meeting? Just a point of information, you said the Democratic Services team, I think you need to make it clear what you mean by that. First of all, you probably need the county council, I guess, and the record services team. But you need to give an email address or something. Yes. There is an email address here in the document which we'll hand out, and it's the Democratic Services team at South Cambridgeshire um, Council. So just remember that, not the city nor the county, the South Cambridgeshire. And now I'd like, we have two further members here, and perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself, Councillors Manning and Borsworth. Uh, so I'm Councillor Ian Manning, County Councillor for Chesterton. Hello, I'm uh, Nigel Gawthorpe, I'm count uh, City Councillor for uh, King's Edges. Thank you. Um, so, yes, th there was a question. Yes, Richard. So I think, could you sk skip the minutes and matters arising? But, uh, something I asked last time was about the 6th of um, July briefing, and you said that you would hold some talks with Councillor Lewis Herbert over whether or not that could be opened up to the public or not. Have those talks taken place, and what were their conclusions, please? Um, OK, that's one question, thank you. And you've drawn to my attention the minutes. Um, I'm just taking, taking a note of that, Richard. Um, You had a question too, uh, coming, up, from, coming up for minutes. I had a question at the last meeting about enforcement of parking on cycling and cycle lanes and verges. I can't see it in the minutes, so that's the end. Yeah. So we can look at this video as well. Thanks, um, Alex. Thank you. Yes. Um, I should have gone through the minutes first. So we do have a copy of the minutes of the last meeting and the meeting at which the minutes were taken but they were not presented at the meeting we held last time. So does everybody have a copy of those minutes and are they content with the minutes with the modification for the amendment that Alex um, has made? Yes. Am I, do I hear any dissent in terms of the minutes as they're being presented? Uh, yes, Chair. I think... Um, 
from different documents here. Uh, at the, there is, under the officer update on scheme development, there is at the top of, the, of page four a statement which says the do nothing traffic modelling for Milton Road showed an increase of 29 minutes in bus journey time. I can't actually find reference to that in the published documents. I have found reference to one bus in 20 being, being overdue by 29 minutes or more in 2014. Um, and looking at the comparison with modelling between doing nothing and doing something, I see that the increase in journey time is anything between 2.0 minutes um, and 2.6 minutes for north for, uh, for PM peak and 2.0 minutes and 8.8 .8 minutes for AM peak. So I can't quite see where the 29 minutes comes from. Right, perhaps one of the officers might address that. My apologies, I was the person who actually put in that 29 minutes at that time, and I'm sorry I can't actually get to the document, but I will actually write to you and clarify the, the source of that if, if it's helpful. And my apologies if I've missed that the other day, because I believe I have not. Thank you, thank you, we appreciate that, thank you. Yes, yeah, so... Oh, I thought it came from the office, I'm sorry. No, good. Thank you. Um, now, are there any more issues on the minutes? No. So we'll accept the minutes then as a true and correct record with the, this is first of all, the um, minutes of the um, Tuesday the 9th of May and um, with the modification that's been put forward by Alex Skinner. And the Wednesday the 8th of February 2017, those minutes too, they were the ones that um, were related to the meeting that we held when we actually confirmed finally our resolution. So everybody's happy with those minutes or notes? I hear no dissent, so we'll accept those two. So those are the two minutes dealt with. And now we come to Mr Taylor's question about the 6th of July. Um, Councillor Herbert, I believe, will be here at the meeting in due course, and then Mr Taylor, you can put the question directly to him, if that's satisfactory. Thank you. Now, any other questions? Yes. Okay, um, so when you gave your um, chair's update, you mentioned some questions that have been raised at the previous meeting and then that you were going to circulate some answers. I don't know what you're referring to there, but can I suggest that if there's anything to circulate, why don't you just publish it on the website so we can all see it? I believe it may be published on the website. If it's not published on the website, then we will make sure that it is. And thank you for drawing that to our attention, Mr Taylor. We appreciate that. Um, so then the, the third item is the LLF resolutions. We've been circulated again with the LLF resolutions and we have a copy before us. And what I need to point out to everybody is that this document, which is headed LLF resolutions, draft officer response, is a document that contains each of our resolutions with a very short or brief, whichever description one wishes, comment underneath it. And this is a comment from the officers. It's not a comment that's been made by the Assembly. It's not a comment that's been made by the Board. It's an abbreviated comment from the officers and that will be uh, expanded upon when a report from the officers goes to both the Assembly and then to the Board in relation to our resolution. So I just really want to make that clear. Now we turn to uh, the officer update on appraisal of Duke Optimum. And the way that we'll run this is, uh, Mr Tunstall, Chris Tunstall, the officer from the City Deal and the County Council, will make the first part of the presentation. And then Mr Neil Poulton, who's the consultant, will con complete the presentation. And it's a presentation based on Duke Optimum, the modelling that's been done, and 
what needs to be modified, if anything. Um, and at the end of each, the, the principal issues really are the junctions in terms of the, any difficulties that arise with the do optimum. So what I'm suggesting is this. The officers present and they do um, the intersection at Gilbert Road and Milton Road first. And when that presentation of that section is complete, then we will have a chance for several questions just directed to that actual bit of the roadway. And then we will proceed to the next intersection, which is the Elizabeth Way roundabout. And then, once that's completed, we'll have some questions time on that. And then to the King's Hedges um, intersection. Oh, no. Yes. The, then oh. to the, sorry, Arby Road and Union Lane. And then comment or questions on that. And then to King's Hedges and questions on that. I think that will be the easiest way to do it. So that we can get through the presentation. People have a chance for brief questions. And then we'll have an open question session at the end. So now I'll hand over to uh, Chris Tunstall to proceed. Okay, good evening everybody. Um, as uh, Chair said, I'm Chris Tunstall. For those that didn't meet me at the last meeting, I'm the uh, Director of Transport for City Deal. Um, what I'd like to do is give you an introduction just to lay out what the principles were for the scheme and what we've been able to, uh, what we've taken on board in terms of board, uh, board uh, direction that we've had following your resolutions and so on. Um, as Jocelyn said, there is no comment back on the resolutions yet, but obviously there were questions raised and the board has come back. Uh, Councillor Lewis uh, came back and gave us certain directions that we needed to go which was great. And can I first and foremost say thank you very much for the input, particularly from Hurst Park and from Milton and from uh, Cam Cycle because it's been really helpful. Um, can I also say what we've got here is a concept. What we'll be taking to the board is a concept. What we're not taking to the board is a final design. There is a lot of work still to do. So what I'm showing you here is not necessarily, in terms of the junctions and modifications, there's work to go through. And we're already talking about having meetings, uh, workshops with the LLF to talk about bus stop positions, to talk about the trees and other issues as we develop it out. So this is not, by any stretch of the imagination, the final. It is very much a concept. So if I can just start and go through. So just to remind you, these were the exec board's um, project object objectives for Milton Road. And we have been given the money to do certain things with, and we have got to follow that through. Otherwise, the money at the end of the day will not be there. So there are certain issues we've got to adopt, and these were agreed as part of the city deal agreement. So what we're looking for on this uh, particular scheme is a comprehensive priority for buses. So it's a bus priority scheme. But it also includes safer, safer and improved cycling and walking as well. Um, we are looking to enhance the environment, so we are looking at the urban realm. As I say, from wall to wall, so it's your boundary wall if you live on Milton Road, to your opposite, uh, the opposite boundary wall. So we're looking at the whole of the road itself. Um, we are looking at improving the capacity of Milton Road in terms of sustainable trips, whether that be by cycling, walking, or uh, public transport. We are looking to improve bus patronage because that's where we'll get the biggest modal shift from uh, in terms of people out of their cars. And as part of that, obviously, we're looking to reduce the general traffic levels. Okay, so then, following the, the earlier meetings of the RLF, um, the board came back, Councillor Herbert came back and said we were looking to maintain uh, a provision of grass verges and trees. I know the first scheme that you looked at was just basically wall-to-wall uh, -wall road and footway. So it was, as we call it, wall-to-wall -wall blacktop. Um, it is not that anymore, and hopefully you'll see that when we uh, start going through the presentation. Um, that we also are looking not to provide double bus lanes. So we're not looking for a four-lane highway down Milton Road, so you do not have a four-lane highway. There are bus lanes down Milton Road, 
but they are not together. So you, you end up with a bus lane and two running rain, lanes uh, for traffic. And we're looking at removing the band turns. Those are the band turns at Gilbert Road, Arbury Road, and King Hedges Road Junction. So we've removed those, all in line with the, uh, the do optimum. As I say, thank you. As I say, we did really welcome the feedback that we got back from you on the work that uh, you'd done on this particularly in terms of what Milton Road the, the residents, um, Hurst Park and Camp Cycle had done. So we've taken on board the do optimum design aspirations and principles um, and those are the concepts that we've taken forward. However, we have modelled that and it is fair to say we need to look at some modifications and we'll go through that but some of the proposals will actually double the queue lengths on um, Milton Road. So basically you will have twice the number of cars queuing now at some of your junctions than you do currently. That's not including, bear in mind we are looking to design for 2031. We're not just looking at traffic levels today, we're looking at 2031 when Water Beach comes on stream and the additional houses that start coming out of, of the additional uh, trips that start coming out of that housing development. Thank you. Okay, so just going back, what we've, we've worked on in terms of the do optimum, we've looked at providing sufficient infrastructure. I have to be fair, bearing in mind you know, buses were a key priority, we actually ended up with less bus lane than we've currently got. We've ended up with about 200 metres more bus lane than we've currently got. We've gone from 1,100 metres to about 1,300. And we've been working with the bus operators to identify the most optimal areas for providing uh, bus lanes. Again, just on one side of the road. They're not on both sides of the road at the same point. They are on both sides, but obviously at different points. Um, and we've been looking at maintaining the access to the junctions. Um, and, uh, but one of the areas that we will come on to is we've looked at remodelling the Elizabeth Way Junction and that impacts, one of the options impacts to try and get cycling and walking impacts on Highworth and we'll come on to that. It is an option, these are just options. These are not designs that are worked up and said this is what we are going with. These are options, it's getting the concept. Once we've got the concept, we can start working up the design and working that in with workshops with yourselves. Um, we've got a tree planting scheme along Milton Road. It isn't on the regular basis that you've got within the do optimum because to be fair we've taken into account all the accesses that are there because there are a lot of driveways coming onto Milton Road and the regular planting which to be fair was just showing a concept out of the do optimum scheme actually plants trees in some of those driveways so we've planted them where we can actually get the trees in but it's the same effect it just doesn't look as regular on the, on the drawings. Um, we've provided a junction solution that doesn't include the closure of Union Lane. We have some options on that and we can work those options up. We have a preferred option and we'll talk about that, um, but we have other options there as well. And then we've looked at, uh, as I say, fitting all of this in with existing drive accesses. And that does affect some of the proposals, particularly around the Elizabeth Way roundabout. So I'll, I'll show why that is shortly. Trees. It would be disingenuous of me to say that this does not affect the existing trees. We are doing a lot of work and the do optimum uh, solution has that work identified. It will affect the trees, it will affect the tree roots. We are looking for a wholesale replacement of the tree stock. But we are looking at that with putting trees in that mature trees, so trees that are three to five metres. Why three to five metres? It depends on the species that we're going for. But a lot of trees that were planted, not saying down Milton Road, but a lot of highway trees that were planted in the past were more like forestry trees, were not opportune for, not the right sort of variety for an urban environment. So we need to get trees that are right for an urban environment. And you'll know the problems. You'll know pay, um, footways that are lifting on cycleways, cycleways that lift where the roots are actually throwing up the pavement there. So what we're looking to do is put trees that are more suitable, but they are mature trees. We are not looking, well, 
semi-mature anyway, three to five metres. We are not looking for whips of trees. We are looking for uh, good trees that are in proper planting conditions that we will look to have to survive. But that will be a workshop that we will work through with you. We've been talking to the city uh, tree people about that. Okay, thank you. So that's just a picture of one of the trees that's been recently planted. Uh, it's not actually on uh, Milton Road. It's, uh, when I find that, it's on Coldham's Lane. Um, but that's an example of the type of tree that we'd be looking to uh, plant. So they're not small trees by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't want to mislead you. They are not mature trees in that sense, in the type of tree that you've got now. Okay, so if I can just show you what I mean about... Next slide, please. So this is the, the existing uh, Elizabeth Way roundabout. The problem that we've got, that we've never allowed today, but this is custom and practice now, is we have accesses that are actually into either the approach junction or actually onto the roundabout itself. And we'll come on to that as to what issues that creates um, when you're creating particular uh, arrangements on your roundabout. So we've got to take that sort of thing into consideration. We can't, well, certainly to achieve certain things, you close it. Well, I'm not too sure the residents of those properties would be, uh, would take kindly to closing. We couldn't anyway, but it is an issue we've got to factor in. The other sort of considerations, thank you. So we've got to, it is the driveways. There are a lot of driveways down, and you can see certainly the bottom picture, there's a lot of uninformed highway uh, accesses. So they're not approved accesses by any stretch of the imagination. And certainly in the past, certain authorities have taken a very strong line on this, where they've actually gone along and started noticing people, telling them they've un uh, an unapproved access, they have to get a proper access there. And there's a cost involved in that. One of the good things with this is we will go along and we will provide accesses wherever an access is required. So we're not looking at all. We'll do that as part of the scheme. So people that have been probably using uh, accesses in the, uh, in the past that haven't been approved, that are just driving over the verges, or trying to use just one access and winding around the tree. Well, just as an aside, I've got to say this. As I came up the other day up to uh, the business park, as I was coming back down, there was a car that was actually driving on the footway on Milton Road to access a verge. That's the sort of thing that we're getting. We will, not that we're going to accommodate parking on the verge, is one of the questions earlier, um, but that's the sort of thing. And yeah, these are the same sort of people. I don't know whether they live there or not. They may have done, they may not have done, but that's how people operate at times. And would I like to say I've ever been there before myself? Well, I won't answer that one. Um, so next slide, please. So. The upshot of this is we're looking to improve the urban realm, but the scheme has also got to give us the transport infrastructure improvements that we require to deal with the anticipated flows that we're going to get on Milton Road from the opening of Water Beach, and in fact on the flows that we get now. But we base this on the Do Optimum uh, scheme. If I can give you a few visuals now of, of what it looks like now, and what it looks like in the future. So ignore the yellow line, that's Google. That's, I think, just the direction that the vehicle's travelling or you're travelling in, because that doesn't occur on the highway. Um, so this is outbound north of George Street. This is what our visualisation will be outbound north of George Street afterwards. So as you can see, the trees are retained. If you go back, uh, actually there's a lot more trees than there is there now. Um, so the trees are retained. Uh, one of the interesting things, you know, a lot of the, the boulevard effect is a lot of the trees are in people's gardens, a lot of the greenery is in people's gardens, and that's what builds on that, that sort of impact. When you actually look at the highway in certain places, there's a dearth of trees. Next one, please. So this is uh, Askham Road. That's what it looks like now. That's what it will look like in future. So we've got the verge retained, we've got trees on both sides, there isn't a verge on both sides, um, we've got uh, cycling provision there on both sides, not perhaps as much cycling provision as is in the do optimum, but we'll go through uh, that in terms of width, but we've maintained the busway there as well. 
Next one, please. So this is uh, Downham's Lane. Again, lots of green verge. Weren't a tremendous amount of trees. But and as you can see, you get that impression it's more about individual gardens and the volume of trees and hedges and so on in individuals' gardens. But there, that's what we're aiming for. And that's based on the do optimum. But there are certain things that gave, um, perhaps in terms of the width of the cycleway, but as I say, we'll come on to that. Okay. And this is Ramston Square. There are more trees on there. But that's what we're looking at afterwards. So I hope you can see we have tried desperately to keep the, uh, the concepts that you've got in the do optimum. With, I think, personally, and bear in mind I'm a highway engineer, so probably I'm not the right person to talk to, um, but I think we've, we've retained, uh, we've, well, personally I think we've improved the tree line boulevard effect of those. But most of the issues occur around the junctions, so I don't want to mislead you. It is the junctions that we, uh, we need to uh, look at. So just on the slides, which we will make available, put on the website, that just gives you where the pictures are being taken uh, and uh, in which direction you're looking. So when you look on the slides, you can get a better feel for that. So that's the introduction. I would just re-emphasize, this is about developing the concept based on the do optimum. This is not a final detailed design. There is a lot of work still to do on this. We are gonna work this through with yourselves to get the detailed design right. But obviously the key issues will start to come out when you start to look at the junctions. So at that point, Chair, I'm happy to stop and take any questions about that. And then if we could let Neil, as you suggest. Yeah. Now, does anybody have any question to Chris Tunstall? on the presentation so far. Yes. Is it oh, three. Here, yeah, Alex, think then yes, and then at the back there, please. Okay, so then go back to the actual road. There's a cycle lane that's not yeah, this one. So this it's not the cycle lane is not it's on the other it's on the road side of the trees. I can see a divide there. Is that a painted white line or is that a curve? It's come out. It'll be a curb, the, be the drop curb that we put in. So it, it gives that element of segregation, um, but obviously it's not total segregation. Okay. My name's Anne Hammond, and I'm looking at the concept as a whole as you've presented it so far, and you also mentioned the impact of the water beach development where there's a railway station already. And my question concerns the impact the North Railway, uh, North Cambridge Railway Station will have on the whole of Norton Road. Uh, and the, the station provides people living in the north of Cambridge and in the villages access to Cambridge via the main railway station, by using the North Station, and ultimately they'll have access to animals too. So surely this will reduce traffic levels, uh, but the case is that it's been predicted that there will be huge increases in peak time traffic. So I want to know what measures, uh, and also, I want to know what measures are to be taken so that residents who live in the area will have easy access, bus access, to the North Railway uh, Cambridge Railway Station. We don't know what impact, I mean, at the moment, it is not running at the level south, uh, the North Station is not running at the level uh, of usage that was initially predicted, but it's early days, it will, it will build up. And you are right in, in saying there will be uh, people that will use that. The issue that we get with drivers, once they've made a decision to drive, even with park and rides, they know where they need to go. Part of the problem is the trains nor the buses actually normally take them in that direction, they have to change. They very rarely, once they uh, make that decision, unless they're deciding just to drive to the park and ride on the station, get out at that point, they carry on driving. But they're not going to use the buses then, you're saying? Well, well, they don't. No, because the logic, the logic that goes in terms of, if they, get, they can get on the train, yes, and then if they can get down to the train station and then do the, the change over there. But I, I actually had a, a, a gentleman, I shan't say who it is, who goes to the Adam Brooks site 
drives past Babram every day, but still drives to the Adam Brook site. And that's the sort of, that, that's what happens. <coughs> I know the logic doesn't say that should happen, but that is actually what happens. So the provision of any amount of bus and numbers of buses is not going to affect it, if your logic is right. What we need, observation is right. What we need to do is to ensure that we give all the alternatives that are possible. We're not going to get everybody that currently goes on the bus going to the train station. So That's they right. will they will use the buses, and they do use the buses from the park and ride. We know the park and ride does work. What we don't know is how many people are physically going to... If people are coming in from Waterbeach, why are they going to go past the park and ride to the station necessarily? If they're coming in from Waterbeach, they can get the train from Yes, but we don't know how many will do it. That, that is the snag. What we do know is that as part of all the proposals, this is why we've had City Deal, to actually improve the transport network. Yes. North Cambridge was part of that. We've got to improve. If we don't improve, do something on Milton Road, then it's not going to meet any of the objectives we've got for City Deal money. If we incentivise the people who are living in the new communities, then they will use public transport. I agree. But it's, it's also the people that live on the top side of Milton Road, they come through here as well. So even people, that the residents that live on Milton Road, actually drive down Milton Road. So they do, everybody affects everybody else, it's Which not... Which is why I asked the uh, supplementary introduction here about what's access here for Milton Road residents. Because they're going to be affected by that. Yeah. 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 Y
it's not going to be possible to make them a two-way runner on the road. Maybe you can talk about this. Right. Now, there are two more. Yes. Uh, uh, my question, went about, is about, um, you said that this is a concept of trees. Okay? It's a two-part question. So are you going to have landscaping, a proper <coughs> landscape ring to landscape the trees into the streets of the roads? Because um, my, my feeling is that what you're actually doing is giving the question, what you're doing is making the roads look wider. So you actually do need professional expertise uh, in people to actually look at how you address the problem of making residential roads not look wide. That's the first question. And the second question, which is very obviously close to just right, um, is the sense that everybody's talked about uh, air quality and pollution. So, for example, how does greenery and trees fit into uh, a minimum amount of air quality, and how is air quality and pollution going to be addressed in the overall concept of this scheme? Right, thank you. And then, then, no, then there was one question just yeah. down here. <coughs> yes. yes, that must be you. Yes, oh, I saw your hand. Um, Hilary Goy, puzzled at First Park Avenue. If you don't think people are going to abandon their cars. Why has Cambridge North Station been built? And why are you bothering with bus lanes at all? Yeah. Yeah. Can you respond to each of those, um, Chris, and then we'll oh, move on? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, is this still working yet? Fine. So in terms of the cycleways, there are still sections of two ways. Um, that we will work up as part of the, the process, so we're not saying we won't. It is a matter though of getting as much as we can get in. Um, bus priority is an issue down here. Actually what happened with the scheme was the, the Do Optimum scheme, we took bus lanes out. So we're trying to get bus lanes in. And I know I'll come on to the, the question, it's like anything else, we've got to provide, in terms of the, the quality of alternatives, we've got to provide the quality of alternatives. If people see themselves sat, sat in a bus in the same queue as they're sat with traffic, they will not naturally look to get out of their car. And their logic will be, if I, par if I drive past this park and ride, because we've already got a park and ride, if I drive past this park and ride now, I will save X minutes in parking up, walking to the bus, getting on the bus, by which time I'll be part way down Milton Road and I'll be part of the problem. So that's why we put the bus lanes in, to encourage people to see that the buses are faster and are more reliable than actually sitting in the car. Sorry, um, no, no. Still we move on because otherwise we're not going to get to the end. <coughs> <laughs> so what numbers did you anticipate? Sorry? I was talking about local cycle journeys. Can you just mention that bus? No, the local cycle journeys, in terms of the, there will be elements of that that are two way. I thought that was the original question. Cycle infrastructure. We're introducing so, more cycle infrastructure than we currently have. Some of no, it may no, not be two way. In the region working very heavily, you're going to remove the cycle infrastructure and you're going to keep the existing bus lane that's there. I'm not sure, I'm not sure, unless I'm going to be told, we are removing cycling infrastructure. Yeah, there are two ways. <coughs> okay. Two ways to manage right. There is sections it? of two ways still on there. I mean, it's difficult to tell on that, what width that is. But that cycleway on the, on your right, is the same width of the footway, and the width of the footway is two metres. Yeah, so is that a two-way on the right? Look, um, sorry, please stop here. If, Neil, if you're going to actually go through the road, then I think that we'll deal with it at that stage. Yeah, please okay. move on to the next piece. Okay. Of in terms of the modelling, the modelling's been done, you asked about water beach. We can only go on what is, and people have asked us, so we've got evidence for that. We use modelling tools. We use the same tools in determining when a development is being built, how many cars are going to be generated on that development, same way as we do for children, how many children are, are actually going to be from that development to determine how many schools, places we need and so on. And that is fed into the model. So it is a tried and tested, we could debate that all day, but that is the tried and tested way of dealing with it. Sorry, sorry, please. 
The next question was about the trees, the landscaping, air quality, pollution. So trees, as everybody knows, trees are a good air quality thing. The more trees we have, the more carbon it takes out of the atmosphere, which is great. At the last meeting I also mentioned we are starting to talk to the operators now about moving away from potentially diesel engined to maybe hydrogen and electric. So in terms of putting in green, that's good because it improves the environment. Sorry? We have a figure on what we need to do with all the air quality and pollution. We have a figure We have figures, certainly Mitcham's Corner is a, a major pollutant area in terms of we have an air quality zone and we have those figures. We are looking at putting an air quality management zone in. So whether we think it or not, there are areas that are well above the European standards. But see, that relates to your, what you're actually putting in terms, sorry, in terms of the actual amount of green stuff, infrastructure, the overall pollution that yeah. also relates to on that. Yeah. And it's just the, the actual general environment and the look of it. And, and that, and yeah, the professional going, expertise sorry, will come please, from the City please, Council. Please, please, We're going to have a workshop on trees. We're going to have a workshop on landscaping. We can deal with all this in the workshop. I think that's a better place to deal with it because then everybody gets a chance to discuss it. <laughs> everybody has a chance to uh, have responses and so on. Could we move on to the next question, which was that if people are not using or not using the North Cambridge Station, what's the point of having it there and why are we having bus lanes if people aren't going to be people, using it? People are using it, but people make decisions when they pass certain points. They decide whether to get off at that point because they're going somewhere in the city that's actually convenient or gets a bus straight there, or they decide they can actually get there faster than the bus. The reason they decide they can get there faster than the bus is the buses are tied up in the same traffic that they are, so they already know that they're in advance of that traffic. If we took bus lanes out, where else do the, how else do the buses get in front of the cars that are already in front of them? So the idea is, is to get the buses further into the city and make that journey more of an acceptable journey for people. You know, why would anybody get out in a park and ride if you're going to end up in a bus that's behind everybody else that's just driven past the park and ride? Excellent. Many thanks, Chris. And then we move on to Neil Holton. And there'll be the opportunity for questions right at the end. Okay guys, so uh, my name is Neil Hulton and I am the project manager from WSB on the consultant side. Um, many of you will have known me from the LNF uh, sessions that we all did together. Um, what I'm going to do is talk through the modelling. Now obviously it's always difficult how to pitch this uh, with an audience of different mixed uh, interests in, in kind of the modelling results that have come out. So we try to show them as clearly as we can and make them as easy as understandable as they can be. Without trying to bore you too much or too much. Uh, in one go. So let me just talk you through what we've used for the modelling for those that might be of interest. Um, so we've looked at the due optimum, as we promised, we've, we've looked to model that. So we've used what's called a parametric model. That's uh, uh, it's validated to 2016, so that means we've taken survey data from uh, 2016 surveys and we make sure the model replicates those flows and movements uh, in those periods. So we've got a base level in which we can put changes on and see how that affects the flows. Um, it's an industry standard modelling software, so and particularly this modelling software is used where we're looking at multiple junctions along a corridor, and we're seeing not just what changing that junction would do, or we could use independent modelling software on those junctions, but also how the impact, the cumulative impact of all those changes make on the corridor. We also look outside, slightly outside the corridor, into the side roads, um, going up to A14, and we've got the park and rides here to cover for the buses that are coming through the model. Um, we've got uh, down to the Mitchell's corner, and obviously we've got sections coming off, um, which then um, we've got the survey data for. Um, what we, to account for how things might change in the future, we um, take a matrix of movements, uh, journeys, um, and we run those through CSRM, so that's the county's strategic right model, so things like the station coming into play, Water Beach, anything that's in the local plan is already in that strategic model. So we use that to identify what impact that's going to have on Milton Road, so that for any future modelling we understand already what the impact might be before we apply <coughs> excuse me, uh, additional changes. What I'm going to show you today is the 2016 model, with 2031 is what our future year is. 
Um, that's still being undertaken, that modelling work at the moment, but we want to be able to provide you what we've got at the moment, so we've got 2016. In some ways that's helpful because you obviously know or you've got your perceptions of how traffic is at the moment. So hopefully when we've done any comparison, we've done that versus the current situation as validated with the model. So you can see what the changes will be today, but bear in mind in 2031 we're obviously looking for a lot more traffic. So if anything, the situation would get worse rather than better in terms of some of the queuing. Um, but we're looking at those results at the moment and we'll, we'll present those to you uh, once we've got that all completed. And when I'm showing you the results here, we're looking in the AM peak, so we're looking between 8am and 9am, and then we're looking between the PM peak, which is 5 to 6pm. So just to give you assurances, so um, the LLF came up with the dual option design, and obviously uh, we fully appreciate you're not highway engineers, it was a concept that you presented to us. Uh, to enable us to uh, undertake this kind of modelling and design, we've, we've done some very uh, initial design work to see what that would look like. So our best endeavours in trying to account for some of the elements of highway design that wouldn't have been accounted for, and turn that into an engineering design and take measurements off and, and put into the modelling software in which to run the junctions. Could you just tell us what that diagram shows? So, so all that, so that's showing the, 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 the um, essentially, this is the design that's presented to us, and this is just indicating to you some of the work that's been undertaken to turn that into a engineering design so we can run that through the model essentially. And where is that? That's the junction of Gilbert Road. Yeah. That's Gilbert Road as that example. Um, I mean this is all rough in the background sort of stuff but it's just to give you assurance that we haven't, we've actually taken the design and turned it into a, and as we said we've looked at it into the engineering terms. Um, so in terms of the key outputs from the modelling that I'm going to talk you through today, we've got journey times for the whole route, average bus journey times and reliability, uh, performance of key junctions, relative to queuing and delay, and a comparison with an existing scenario. And as I said, this is for 2016, not 2031. So this is how it would be at the moment, not how it would be in the future. We need to undertake the future. The whole point of the scheme is about future uh, traffic impacts and how we mitigate that. Excuse me, can I just ask one of sorry, the questions? Sorry, no, sorry. We're no. going to have the questions at the end, because no, otherwise no, no, we're not going to... Just clarification, journey times for whole route. What do you mean by the whole route? If you just wait for the next slide, I will... <laughs> That's why it would be wise if people would actually wait until Neil has got to the end of Gilbert Road, and then we will have questions. Thank, Thank you, Neil. Just, um, so this is so. When, in terms of uh, when we talk about the the whole route, we're looking at the whole scheme that we're encompassing essentially. So north of Kings Hedges Junction all the way down to just before Mitchell's. So that's where we're looking to undertake some changes, so that's what we're talking about, how we've taken the, the timings from the model. Obviously the model has goes beyond that, but that's what we've looked at, because obviously that's where we're making our changes. So this is where we started. So we put the do optimum um, design into the model, and we looked at what that was generating in terms of, I'll talk you through the details of that, but I just want to give you an overarching uh, kind of impact to see where we started from and where we worked to kind of uh, work through the design we provided to us. So as you can see, if we put in everything that's in the do optimum at the moment, then we, the model is indicating to us, and, the, and this is the current situation, that we'd essentially see almost a doubling of queuing that would occur in the uh, inbound in the AM peak. So that's an increase of around from seven and a half minutes, the model's indicating, uh, journey time to about 16 and a half minutes. Um, so in, in terms of outbound, that, that's not so uh, impactful um, as you'd expect because most people are coming into Cambridge in the morning. When we look at the uh, PM peak, it's not so intense in terms of, you know, that spreads in terms of people leave work at different times, so it's not so intense in terms of the amount of people that are trying to travel uh, out of the city. Um, it still has an impact on that, increasing by about two minutes in terms of journey time inbound and outbound, uh, and I'll, I'll talk you through where that's coming from. But that's where we started from, which made us think we've got to look at these junctions again. This is really where the junctions are having impacts rather than between the junctions. And uh, we'll talk you through what we've done to try and take your design concept, but enable that to work in a highways capacity sense. Is this the bus itself? This is into all vehicles. Including bicycles? No. No, because that's not a... All motorised vehicles. So you're modelling the bicycles, it's not on there yet. Where, when do you get into that? We do not have, there isn't the ability to, what we've done in terms of bicycles, just to ask that quick question, is we've, you may have seen the guys, they've been undertaking surveys along the route, undertaking the journey movements of cyclists at the moment, so we can understand the key desire lines and the kind of number of cyclists who are coming around the junctions, we don't have that data. The modelling software in the industry at the moment doesn't have the ability to 
model cycle movement, so we have to take account of that in other ways in terms of higher in terms of local knowledge, which we'll fit in, and also in terms of our highway engineering knowledge of how we can accommodate cycles. Yeah, we've got big oh, sorry, please, 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 don't listen to Okay, yeah. I'm really sorry, but if you could please wait until Neil has finished his speech. Please exercise the capacity to remember the question you have. If you need a pen, I've got plenty of pens here and paper. You can write your question down and then at the end of this bit of the presentation, you can ask your question then. Please have the courtesy to allow Neil to complete this. Thank you. In terms of looking at bus reliability, I mean, that's a key element of the scheme that we're looking to improve. Um, at the moment, there are obviously bus lanes on Milton Road. And in the Dioptan scheme, there would be no bus lanes on Milton Road. So I'm just trying to indicate through this slide to you what kind of level of impact that was going to have. So this is outbound in the current situation. And then this is the outbound in terms of the Dioptan. And you might say, well, it looks very little difference. But outbound at the moment, there isn't any really any bus lanes anyway at the moment. So as we'd expect, we wouldn't see too much change in that. Journey times, average journey times has increased for leaving the city. This is in the AM peak. Um, but otherwise, not massive amount of change. When we start to look inbound, so coming into the city of the MP, this is the current situation. So we're seeing an average journey time probably around eight, nine minutes. Um, obviously, when we look at the do optimum with uh, no bus lanes in here, obviously with the demand that's coming through, suddenly not only do we get a massive increase in average journey time for that bus, uh, increasing uh, almost double, I would say, we're also seeing this is the variability from the average. So we're seeing a massive variability on, on, on the journey time. So they're becoming less reliable and able to meet their timetable as they're coming down. So hopefully this indicates the importance of why, in the current situation, we do have bus lanes and taking them out completely, there really is, Chris has tried to say, there is no really any incentive for people to take the buses. Um, and, and therefore we won't get that kind of modal shift we're hoping to achieve. So in terms of reviewing this information, what we've gone, then gone on to do, to look at, is review and test alternative junction designs, which look to balance vehicle journeys along Milton Road, while maintaining the principle to do optimum, I'll talk you through those at the moment. We've identified optimum locations for bus priority, as I said, we need to, and as Chris has said, we're not really providing any more in terms of bus lanes than are currently there at the moment, but what we can't be doing is taking them away, so having a worse situation. What we've done is optimise where those are located, so we can't have them on both sides of the road, not four lanes of traffic, just three, but what we've done is place them in different locations based on where the modelling is indicated to give us an optimum use of that. Um, landscaping and tree planting opportunities, we've tried to maximise that where possible. Where there's elements, as the gentleman's brought up a number of times, where you prefer to maybe see more cycling and less maybe green space, we can accommodate that, you know, we can move some of these around. This is a concept, but we're trying to capture as much as we can of what the do optimum is. Right, so the key modelling junctions we're going to look at today are the key ones that obviously along Milton Road and affect uh, the movement of traffic. So let's go with Road in this way. Arby Road and King's Hedges. So, um, we started with Do Optum, um, and that's a picture of the current situation. Now, when we looked at this in terms of how we could uh, turn this into something we can model, there's a number of key elements with the design already which, just in highway terms, can't really be accommodated. So, this junction's been really brought in and really tightened up so you can accommodate these kind of cycle movements and also this green space. In reality, that kind of movement uh, wouldn't be achievable. Once we track that, it's just too tight for vehicles. So we've had to look at it. But in terms of, so what we've put into the model is as close as we can to this design, but obviously we've had to make small uh, alterations of the modeling software can work in terms of movement of vehicles, it wouldn't be achievable. That's understandable, it's a concept that you provided to us. We appreciate that's just, it's, a, it's a, your thoughts on what you want to see, and therefore we've, we've tried to do that. Um, there's a re-establishment of the right-hand lane as well, um, as well as the straight on. Um, and signal staging, we've assumed, is very similar to the current situation because there wasn't necessarily any information on that, so that's a kind of more fair comparison. So, as we've seen, so red is the do optimum and blue is the current situation. So, in terms of on Milton Road, inbound and the end, they're very similar, there's not much difference there at all. In the PM, in fact, the do optimum looks to be an improvement in terms of stuff coming into the city. Uh, a bit of reverse, I guess, a flip on that in terms of stuff coming out of the city. Uh, it's slightly worse for the doom optimum in terms of the queue lengths, uh, particularly in the PM peak. And again, in Gilbert Grove, we're seeing quite similar. Um, again, 
On the AM, there's an improvement with the dioptum, but in the PM, uh, there's this benefit compared to the currency trust. So it's reasonably well balanced. You kind of expect some sort of movement around. There's not a massive amount of difference between the two, so really, between the current situation and the one being proposed. So what we've tried to do in terms of this is the design which we've we've looked to do to in terms of what we can accommodate really in terms of trying to match your design. So this is yours here, and this is what we've we've taken we're putting forward as a concept. So we're trying to retain the cycling features as much as we can here. Um, there isn't the width that's kind of indicated here when you actually um, are on site. It's quite a bit tighter. Um, so in reality, in terms of when you've got the vehicle movements, you, we've got to push those slightly back. We haven't got the generosity we've got here in terms of uh, these elements. Um, in terms of a, a dedicated right-hand lane, we've, we've, it's kind of a half lane. There's the ability for people to do that and people to negotiate. Um, we, there is still movement here. We could look at there's still movement that could be looked at in terms of accommodating how we, we shift some of this uh, space here. But in general terms, we've, I hope you can see, we've tried to, uh, with the bus lane obviously included in there, try to accommodate as much as possible. Um, and still high priority there for pedestrians and cyclists whilst trying to improve the capacity of the junction. So in terms of that design versus uh, the do optimum versus the current situation, um, we're still maintaining some of the key elements in terms of the priority of cyclists and pedestrians, I hope you can see that. Um, but we're getting a slight optimisation there from um, using that, that semi right hand turn rather than a dedicated. Um, and therefore, from the, the analysis, that one looks to be uh, the, the most optimised solution that we can come up with for this junction, which works in highway terms, works in safety terms, and tries to encompass the ethos of what's there in the, in the two autumn side. Yeah. Does anybody have questions or issues to raise in relation to the Gilbert Road intersection and what's been said? Uh, uh, yes. Granite only models car flow, it's just kind of essential. It does, yeah. But there is. Well, and, and bus, you can dedicate it, but it, motorised vehicles, yeah. There is a version of Pramex that models pedestrian flows. There's PTV do a software that looks at pedestrian flows. Um, but they're not interchangeable in terms of the, the site scale of the model. Usually you'd use those for kind of station in, in terms of if you were designing a, yeah, that's uh, a stadium sort of thing in terms of modelling pedestrian uh, movements. Um, so what all we can do is what we've done, which is go and take up-to-date survey data of where those movements are, and then as part of the process, when we go further into the more detailed design, we'll have obviously uh, sessions with the LLF. We'll look at the kind of concept we're putting forward, and if it's a question of, you know, on this section we need more two-way cycling, and we're we, you know, willing to accept we'll have less of a dedicated uh, pedestrian element on there. We, what we've shown in that downwards lane is obviously a dedicated pedestrian and a dedicated cycle. That could be combined into one massively shared area. Um, there's a, um, also, when we've looked at the um, cross sections, we've designed around the minimum width, and often there's, there's a lot more width to play with. So we haven't looked at it at the moment because we're not that detailed design, we're at a concept stage, so we've got the ability to accommodate that as we go forward. Now, I've got, uh, well, five questions now, and we'll stop at that. Mike Sargent, Hilary Goy, Anna Bradman, and I should have welcomed Anna Bradman, Sorry, who's the councillor for... Milton. 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 County Council and Water Beach Division. And Water Beach, that's right, yeah. And so, Mike, uh, Hilary, Anna, and then there are two here. Um, yeah, well, one and then two. Do I wait till they're all in our store? Yes, yeah. let's, let's do that if we can. Yeah, so, please go ahead. So Neil, on this, you don't actually have any data about bus times and the impact on bus times through, through the um, through the junction. Um, and just looking at it, it doesn't seem to be much difference between all of the options, um, the way you put it across. So it's two optimums, it looks just about as good as your modified two optimums. I'd like you to comment on that. Right. Wait, now, was it Hillary or Anna? I, I think Hillary first. Um, I'm very concerned about the removal of the dedicated right-hand lanes um, at Gilbert Road. When the dedicated right-hand lane was removed at the end of the way, um, well, the Highworth Avenue roundabout, the traffic immediately formed a queue because instead of having two queues, one of which is going to go in one direction and the other is going to go straight on, you, all, you had one queue with twice as many cars in it. How can you justify removing the dedicated right-hand lane? It will cause more jam. 
just to quickly answer that, it, it does, there is no right hand turn lane at the moment. We're putting it back in both designs, both the Optum and the modified Optum. Have you just said you're removing it? Right. No. I don't think so, or if I did, I would. Yeah, sorry, sorry. You said there wouldn't well, be a dedicated right hand lane. Well, now we know there is. Okay, um, here and then two, and, and another one. I'm sorry, it's difficult to see. I think it was smooth. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, my question is yeah. simply technical. Is what are the units on the um, vertical axis? Are they time or distance? No, so they stop. are. Please stop. Sorry, sorry. Right, next question. <laughs> Next question, please. I, I think it was you. Yeah. All right. Well, my name is Gary Gibbons. Um, my question is, to what extent are your models sensitive to the mix of traffic? For example, can you determine how things would change if you just removed all large lorries from the traffic flow? Right. Then another, there was another one just over there. Yeah, perhaps it was another one. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to make a uh, point. There are uh, bus lanes in the new Optimum proposal, so I was a little puzzled when you said that there are none. I hope that didn't affect the modeling uh, assumption. Uh, there are also targeted bus measures, such as Q-jump lanes and stuff like that. But yeah, the Gilbert Road Junction was created the way it was created, and I appreciate what you did with the tracking, by the way. Thank you for that. The Because that end of Milton Road, it should have been shown in the city access study to have very low traffic compared to the other half and decreasing. And that's why it was felt to be completely inappropriate to have uh, three lanes of traffic there. And as I saw, it squeezes up against the cycle lane, which is exactly the, re the, the problem that do maximum and do something, where we saw people cycling, children especially, would be squeezed up against heavy vehicles. But to bring it back to the Gilbert Road Junction, um, thank you for showing that it as, uh, as expected, the, the right hand introduction of the right hand turn lane helps a lot and makes it so that pretty much it's about the same as the current situation and doesn't affect any of the, uh, the current movements and it makes things better, as you said, in fact. One of the, the, the key questions I, I thought is when you show that the AM peak, uh, the high increase for the AM peak and the high variance for the AM peak journeys inbound, that was completely out of character for all the other, just like an outlier. And that seems rather strange to me because, uh, as we know, people here know, there's plenty of traffic going inbound in the PM. And uh, so does, does that mean that you didn't, is that somehow related to missing out on all the bus priority measures and do optimum? And also, did you take into account the fact that the bus lane that's currently in Mitchum's corner area is used as a parking zone? So if you model that as a bus lane, it's not a bus lane. Everybody just double parks there. So, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mike Sargent asked about the bus times through that junction. Have you modeled the bus times coming through the junction? There was the question about the right hand lane, which we've had clarified it's there. There was a question about times, and sorry. Well, if, if, I, if you remind me of each one and then I'll answer that as we go, if that's okay. So, in terms of the bus going through the junction, so. Uh, this is obviously a corridor model, it's looking at the whole whole journey time coming through, so I'll have to say on these as well, the results coming out of this are obviously we've taken um, queue lengths from the junction, but obviously that has an effect on what's put through the whole scheme in terms of when you get to this junction there may be other effects that have had on the other junctions to allow more traffic to get to this junction, and that, so that's a knock on effects kind of thing, just to see they're not should be just seen in isolation, but in terms of queue lengths we've just identified that for you to to get an idea of what's going on at each of the junctions we're talking about. Um, we can't split out between, particularly between the buses uh, and the traffic. There isn't any particular priority here at the moment for we can look at putting um, bus priority within the signals. That's not there at the moment, so it will be the same for buses as it would be for vehicles at this particular junction in terms of the uh, queue lengths. And this is queue lengths, and to answer the question in terms of what's uh, the measurement, that's in metres. Thank you. Right. Um, and the last one was. Um, how sensitive is the model to the mix? So, so in, in terms of the mix of the traffic, obviously um, we've got the validated um, model data, so we've got the current survey data to indicate what the mix is at the moment, that's what's being used in the model to, to, to put through the model essentially, so in terms of the kind of types of traffic that's coming down onto the road. 
It is an A road, it is a, um, a main route into the, the city. Um, heavy goods vehicles do use that. Um, I guess the model has an ability, um, it's probably fairer to test that with the, with the mix that's in there in terms of both scenarios. What I'm trying to show here is the existing situation versus the optimum, so it's an it's a even comparison between the two, essentially. Well, it would just be interesting to know if you just locked all large vehicles. I realise that I guess there's other impacts on that in terms of where are those then large vehicles taken as an alternative route, and then we're looking into more strategic modelling, which uh, something the CSRM can maybe accommodate to a certain extent, uh, but there's not an effect beyond Milton Road, which will have to be considered a part of that. And then there was Matt's question about whether not taking into account that there were... Yeah, so apologies, that's why I'm today in terms of speaking. So what we've taken the do optimum as it is, so we've got the bus priority where you've placed it, and we've got the bus lanes where you've placed them in the model. Um, so those elements are in there. Uh, we haven't uh, missed those out. Those are the part. And when I get to some of the junctions where you've clearly shown the bus priority, so a unit lane, oh, I can explain the impact that has. Um, uh, I'm just curious, uh, the, both the... Um, Strange outlier of uh, the AMP compared to the others because so you know, the, the too. so the outlier. I'm not sure what you mean by that. So these are these the, are the, 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 the slide. Uh, it's the overall journey. Oh, you mean from the buses? Uh, it was you had a diagram scattered. Yeah, yeah scattered. Yeah, scattered. Yeah, scattered. Yeah, scattered. And, and then the other one so there wasn't an outlier, so that, that was showing you the dot was the average journey time in the models. And the models run 10 times, we take the average of that, and that's the average journey time. So that indicates with the due optimum, that was increasing bus journey times, almost doubling it. And then the two sides of the variations from um, the average um, to show you kind of the difference in variance. Also, if they're closer together, then there's less variance and more regular, more to, to the timetable. And when it's wider, obviously, you're getting more difference in terms of the bus to ability to keep to its timetable. Not get into this too much. Just, I, I mean, the results. It, it should be more more generally distributed, if, if, unless there's something like particularly wrong with the model. And number two, did you count the ones in front of the shops at Lynch's Corner as a bus line? In terms of the current situation, yeah. or in terms, in terms of, of the, the so the current situation, well, yes, yeah, so we've got bus line in there at the moment. So okay, just to let you know, we live in Galilee, that's not bus line. Fine. Good. Now, what we'll do now is move on to um, the Elizabeth Way roundabout or High Worth Avenue roundabout, and then we'll have a chance for questions after that. And remember, there's a chance for questions right at the end of everything. So if we go on to yeah, absolutely. So Elizabeth Way Junction, um, the suggestion was to put a kind of Dutch style roundabout into this location. Um, and again, that's just indicating to you the Duoctima design um, with the bus. Ooh, that's uh, with bus priority lane coming in, which we've accommodated, um, versus the current situation. Um, when you've got something like this with a, a design like the Dutch style, um, what we have is what, what's called points of uh, conflict or, or points where a driver has to consider his whereabouts. So if you're a driver coming, coming down the road here, first of you've got pedestrians to consider, then you've got cyclists, and then obviously you've got the traffic going around the roundabout at the same time. So you've got three points in which you've got to consider, and that essentially slows down uh, your movement into the junction, which is mainly part of the intention. Um, you've then got a, a smaller radius because you've got these buildings, so it's a lot smaller than we've got at the moment. Again, that, that kind of slows down traffic and enables less capacity to come around this junction, which may be part of the design. Um, this is just to indicate that we've looked at accident records, and there's, as I'm sure you're well aware, I don't need to tell you, there's a number of accidents that have obviously occurred in the past. Um, at Elizabeth Way Junction, that's Elizabeth Way there. Um, and obviously in any design that we take coming forward, we've got to accommodate for that um, in trying to make that as safe as possible for cyclists. So, um, when we look at the doctor, bear in mind that, that reduction in capacity, we start to see some quite um, extreme results in terms of how queuings change. As you expect at Highways Avenue, you're not really seeing any difference, there's not really anything feeding into here. Um, coming into the city in the morning, we're seeing about a doubling of queuing um, into, um, into the junction. Um, in the PM, it, it's reasonably stable. Elizabeth Way, though, and coming down onto um, the further junction, um, there's big queuing, and that would have, that has big impacts. It starts to impact on the Chesterton Road junction um, at, within the model, um, and uh, you start getting some, some, some big issues occurring off Elizabeth Way. Um, and then coming out of the city, um, 
although you are seeing a benefit in the AM coming out, uh, there is again a, a disbenefit uh, when we're in the PM. So I think that, that reduction in capacity on the junction uh, means that uh, there is a lot of, of traffic being used through here. Being a roundabout, not signalised, means there's an inability to really link with Arbury Road, which, um, as, as you will probably know from using it, a lot of the issues that are on Elizabeth Way are inability to uh, move around the junction because you get to Arbury Road and then you, you, the signals change and you can't come up to the junction. Um, so the, the, having a roundabout doesn't enable us to control that in any way. Um, so hence uh, that and the reduction in, in capacity that can go through the junction equates to these, these uh, bigger queues, essentially. Um, what we've looked to do then is see what we could do as alternatives uh, that can come forward. So we're putting forward two options at the moment. So this is essentially signalisation of the current roundabout. Um, this is good in that it allows pedestrians to undertake their movements and these are shared surfaces so this is enabling people to be offline uh, undertaking the cycle movements if they, if, at, at certain elements, taking a left turn at each, um, each of the arms. Highways Avenue is not closed um, and it's a signalisation of the roundabout. Second option, and this is to be kind of debated but let's put it out there for, for discussion, is a three arm signalised junction, obviously that gives a lot more space for, for green uh, landscaping. Um, we've got a shared use space here again, so this is what I'm talking about in terms of we have got shared use cycle lanes um, and those, those can be extended further along the road where we've got the width to do so. Uh, we've got dedicated um, offline cycleways, we've connect, connected all the uh, dedicated pedestrian crossings that are there. Um, so we've looked at two options to see what difference those would have in terms of when we model those compared to uh, the options being put forward to us. So looking at the differences, so blue is the current situation, red is the do optimum, um, and this is the total vehicle queue length, so this is taking all the arms, adding them all up together, um, and then seeing what the total is to give you a kind of overall picture for comparison. When we look at the do modify, so that's a three-armed junction with the closure of uh, Highway Avenue. Obviously it's slightly better, um, but it's still, what we're doing is we have an all-red phase, obviously, to allow all those pedestrian movements. So that still takes quite a lot of capacity out of the junction, um, so it is going to be, if we went with something like that, it would still be worse than the current situation. In terms of a signalised roundabout, that always is going to have uh, benefits because you're taking out that um, sense of uh, delay and hesitation of drivers coming into a roundabout. If you're coming into the roundabout at the moment, you're obviously looking to see who, who's also on the roundabout and that makes you pause. When it's signalised, it means that you, can, you know when you're good to go and you know when you can't go. Um, so a signalised roundabout always increases capacity. It's also a good thing that because each arm's been triggered in turn, you can allow pedestrian movements to interweave almost, or a pedestrian cycle to be put into play as you go around the roundabout, rather than in a signal junction, you need to ideally close down all the arms to allow those pedestrian movements. So a signalised roundabout at this location, and I think there's still some work to kind of get, maximise the space we do with that, looks to be the best option going forward in terms of Elizabeth Way. Sorry, excuse me, can you just go back to please, just to remind us which is Yeah, sorry, so... Sorry, have you finished on the... I have, yeah. Okay. Okay. So modified to optimum signals and signal roundabout. So the yellow is the signals and the purple is the signalised roundabout. And go back. The yellow one, right? That's what we're Okay. Okay, so blue is the current situation, red is the two optimum, so the Dutch style roundabout, yellow is a three arm signal junction, purple is the signalised roundabout, so not um, too different in design, except we have got shared dedicated cycleways on all sections of the arm. Um, but again, because we've kept the roundabout and the size of it, that gives uh, limited ability to change too much around the junction. Um, especially with fitting signals in, but it does give you that optimisation in terms of, of that particular junction. Good. Now, I can see a whole lot of hands. Um, <laughs> if we'll, we'll have it in threes, then I think that's probably easier. And if then, um, let's have somebody who hasn't asked a question right up the back there, and then just, um, no, here, yes. So we'll have those three, and then if you respond, yes. Okay. So, um, given that the aim of this exercise was to 
increase, prioritise bus transport into Cambridge? Uh, sorry, given that the, of the aim of this exercise, one of the, ex one of the aims was to prioritise bus transport to improve transport into Cambridge, am I right in thinking that the signalised roundabout, in other words, the purple bars, is the only solution that meets those criteria, actually? Right, stop there. Sorry, mm -hmm. yes, in here. Yes. yes. How can you justify saying signalised junctions improve the flow of traffic when on the New Market Road junction there, the lights are not working, the traffic flow is actually very high, much higher. And if you do your uh, Optima or Plan 2 for it here at Elizabeth Way Junction, you will be sending the traffic out onto the Armoury Road and then increasing the truck problem at the Armoury Road Junction. Yes. Right. Good. And then there was somebody here that I need to pay. I'm sorry. If, if you'd remember who you are, <laughs> that would be the better thing. It's easier for you to remember who you are than me to remember. There was somebody at the back there on this side. Well, somebody else then. Who else? Yes, in the front here. Um, the signalised junction. I don't understand how a cyclist going up Milton Road, how they get across the junction. Yeah. Right. So those Oops. three. Oh, sorry. Have you finished? Sorry, big pardon. I didn't mean to interrupt. No? I finished? Sorry, just could you just remind me? The first um, one was. Mine, I can go off this Prioritising bus transport. Prioritising bus transport uh, through, through the. Oh, so the big many. Yeah, so um, in this particular junction, um, we've got to look at the corridor as a whole, and um, at the end of this, I'll give you the statistics I gave you earlier in terms of how bus journey time improves. So we've got to look at um, how the bus priority works across the whole corridor. At this particular junction, for vehicle movements, which would include bus movements, um, the best optimised solution would be the signalised roundabout at this particular location. But the whole point of the primary one is to look at that in terms of parallel, in terms of how it works for other junctions, um, particularly in this one, how it's interacting with um, Arbury Road Junction, um, and, uh, which is what we've been able to um, look at with this type of model. Now the next question was that how can we say that signalised junctions actually improve traffic flow when we know that apparently on market, New Market Road this is not the case? So uh, every junction is, you know, obviously uh, has to be modelled in itself, um, but in general terms, uh, if you've got a roundabout, as I, as I tried to explain, in terms of roundabout, if it's uh, very busy roundabouts in Elizabeth Ways, and you've got that drivers coming in and having to obviously stop, look, accommodate um, who's coming on the roundabout, that that puts into a delay. When you signalise it, enables people, particularly in a busy peak hour situation, enables that to be regularised, and those arms which need more green time, more more access to cross over the, around the roundabout, have that ability is a bit easy ability to manage it, which therefore results in great capacity. Um, that's, uh, that's generally the case, but obviously you have to look at each junction, hence why we've modelled a number of different situations here to see what effects at this particular junction, based on the flows we've taken from our survey data. Good. And then how do cyclists get across the junction? Okay, so in terms of how cyclists cross in terms of, I think it was in terms of the art, the... It's the middle one. The middle one, okay. So, sorry, I think what's going on my... Laser, but uh, oh, there we go. Um, so we have got crossings so on, on each arm here. So each of these crossings, so you like that if you're coming up, say Elizabeth Way, and you want to take a left turn, you could just stay offline. So this is a shared pedestrian cycle service, so you can carry on onto Milton Road equally on all these uh, coming into either of these Sorry. arms. In terms of if you want, if you want to go kind of right around the junction, either you have to sit in the current situation, obviously, you, we could potentially put priority for cyclists, give them a head start, but they would have to be on the road, or they would have to undertake each crossing at a time to get around the junction. But that, what we're trying to do is we're trying to balance all different users at this junction. Sorry, Obviously, then an option like this provides more priority for cyclists, but it's trying to accommodate that with what's there in the existing situation. There are limits to what we can put in unless you get the situation at this very busy junction where you limit vehicle Sorry, capacity too greatly. I couldn't hear what you said because you talked so fast at the beginning. If I'm coming up Milton Road, is there yes. a priority for a cyclist in front of that? Is that what you're saying? 
The, we could look, as I say, these are concepts at the yeah. moment. So yeah. in terms of, yes, we have the ability, that, it doesn't, it's not showing out in there, but because we're signalising it, there would be ability to give cyclists a head start at each of these junction, like, at each of these signalised locations. Because so, at the moment it looks like the cyclists go up Highworth Avenue, uh, which they don't want to do if they go so, up. So you're talking about, where, is the, where are you talking about cyclists coming from? Up Milton Road. Up Milton Road, okay. Left so they, to right, right, right. Okay, so if they want to, yeah, so if they want to, if they'd either, they have to come, if they want to go straight ahead, they can either take the shared surface, uh, on Highworth Avenue there isn't a lot of traffic, so we've not put a dedicated crossing here. There's not a lot of people, as the, as the uh, data shows, there's not an awful lot wanting to go up Highworth Avenue. So therefore, you'd undertake to here, take a crossing yourself and then get back into the shared surface. But as I said, these are concepts, it's, it's about looking at where the signalisation of this roundabout works. We can go into more detail, there'll be sessions to work into looking at the broad concepts of what we're going to do with these junctions. Are we turning it into a three-arm signalised? Are we doing a signalised roundabout? Are we doing a Dutch style roundabout? Are we leaving it as it is? That's what we're at the level of trying to accommodate in the moment. Um, now, I see three, one, and three, it's in the back there. Then, uh, oh, Hillary, you've had a, a couple of goes, so over the back there, if it's somebody who hasn't had a go, and then, um, did you have a question up to now? And then, then if this is a, no, I need to have three people who haven't asked, asked a question earlier. If you stand up, yes. if you would, please stand up. If you want to ask a question, could you please stand up? That's the best thing to do. Yes, yes. Uh, and Matt, just, if, if we'll have you at the end, the, these, these two. And is there somebody else who hasn't asked a question? No, well then we'll have Matt and Richard and Mike, and Mike. so please, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, all right. If you stay standing up when you ask your question, everybody will hear the question and will you know if you've actually had your question asked. Thank you. Neil, you were going through alternative option one and you still haven't explained. If I come from Gilbert Road trying to make a right-hand turn into going towards the Chesterton, area. You have not shown how I safely can bicycle that way. Right. Good. Now, yes, thank you. Yes, please. Um, so speaking as an occupant of one of the four um, houses on the southwest corner, which are the only four properties between this junction and Gilbert Road, which have no provision for on-site parking at all, and are entirely reliant on on-street Okay. And recognising the desire to um, keep the landscape as enhanced as possible in terms of uh, trees and minimising disruption to the highway at all times, but the serious concerns of those residents to have um, to be able to maintain their properties, um, there was a recognition of that um, in terms of needing to do the audit for people who didn't have this provision and making alternative provision where possible for them. Um, there was an inclusion of a slip road, recognising that people have land in front of their properties which could be converted to parking on their own land and therefore in the future when they're maintaining their properties they could have contractor parking, offloading of debris, etc. onto their own properties. <coughs> Has that been considered at this stage as being something which is possible or is that something which would be looked at at a later stage? Sorry, long question, but I just wanted to if I, if Can I just clarify whereabouts on the junction you're... So, come down to the southwest. Those, those properties, These properties yeah. have no... Other properties on the other side have parking behind. The other properties on the other corners have access, as I think was been mentioned before, directly into their properties. But those four properties are entirely reliant on, on street parking. Right. We've got that on board. Richard, then mm. Mm. Speaking as a resident of Hyde Avenue, one of the things that, mm, that troubles me about the modified do option, which is on the far right, is that there's no turning gate. And that means that any vehicle that comes down from the north, as it's drawn there, does not have any opportunity to turn. So mm, I may have mentioned this before, but all of them mm, on several occasions, but I think it doesn't help when these funds are put forward, which I'm afraid cannot be taken on. 
Also, you've set it up capacity at this junction. To the best of my knowledge, this junction does not have any problem with capacity. It is limited by Harbour Road. And I think that when we get to Harbour Road, it would be helpful to meet some of those two together. Very, very happy to meet on site. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say, uh, can you go back a slide? Um, uh, actually, another one, sorry, the first one on this. The reduced roundabout radius slows traffic speed. That is true, and that is the intention of a roundabout. And circulatory capacity, that's not true. In fact, reduced traffic speed increases circulatory capacity, which is why these are used on the continent very successfully. That's why I chose to design this roundabout based on the Dutch Crown Manual, Design Manual for Streets. And I used the parameters that are contained within the Dutch Crown Manual and basically transcribed them directly onto this diagram, recognizing that the current roundabout here is extremely large. So there's plenty of room to work with. So certainly we can adjust and you know, tweak those figures based on more discussion. But the, the idea that this, is, the, that this uh, junction, as presented by the Dutch, uh, can't handle capacity, it comes straight out of the manual. So my theory here, just looking at the slides at the very moment, is that your modeling software is not capable of handling uh, the Dutch style roundabout. And the reason for that is, I know what a micro simulation model does. It tries to simulate the movement of individual cars, which means it has to have an understanding of how drivers uh, behave and how each car behaves. And it seems to me that in this case, it's not quite understanding how drivers handle a roundabout. These types of roundabouts are rated for 25,000 cars per day, and they're used in the Netherlands, and there are ways to increase that capacity if necessary. I would love to discuss this further. Um, I just wanted to bring up that point that you know, I don't believe that the modeling software is handling this correctly, and I think for every ambition so is correct now. If I can just tie in Max and is it Richard? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, Richard together. Um, Richard said that yeah, the capacity isn't an issue at this junction. It's to do with Arby Road um, junction. Um, I think the interconnection and working between them is key. I agree. And therefore, if we have a roundabout with no civilization on, as the Dutch start, we've got no ability to control those two roundabout two junctions together. So I think if we obviously have some ability to signalise this junction and then have that working smartly with the Army Road Junction, that has, gives a great ability to deal with traffic issues at this location. Um, so I was just think, what was the other? Um, there was the issue about cycling access. In terms of, oh, in terms, yeah, just to say to, for the shared, obviously when I show you at the end of this presentation, um, when we get to that point, um, there are lots of elements where we have got um, dedicated pedestrian, dedicated uh, cycling segregated, Certain elements, like a junction here, we just don't have the space to do that. So there has to be some acceptance that in some of these areas where we're trying to accommodate all road uses, there will be some shared services. And in some areas, obviously, we've heard how people would like to have shared services. So I think you have to look at, and there'll be ability to do that at the end, um, to look at the scheme as a whole, rather than obviously we're focusing down the junctions on this element. But we've taken on board what we've said the LLF about segregation, we've tried to accommodate that as much as possible. Uh, in terms of the houses, obviously, uh, this is a, a key junction at the moment uh, along the road. We, and as Chris indicated in the beginning, we have a number of accesses at the moment which, which also would have an impact as well. One of the key accesses is right here on this, this element here, another one that has been accommodated, there's another one here which makes this design difficult to achieve as well when you start looking at the access points that come into the junction from existing residence accesses. Um, 
But also, so we're not able to obviously provide, and I'm maybe I'm misunderstanding your question, but we're not able to provide direct access onto the junction for you um, because we, that's just would be unsafe to do so at the moment. Um, in terms of how we could accommodate you elsewhere on the scheme, that is something we'll have to consider as we go forward in the design in terms of having an, an area potentially that you, you, uh, you've got access to through vouchers if it's parking, theme, whatever. We can look, certainly work with you as a resident in terms of how we can accommodate that to make the situation hopefully no worse than it is at the moment, um, to make improvement, but we can't uh, in, you know, start putting access into a key junction. No, I appreciate um, that, that, was, that wasn't even within the design. It wasn't you pushing the health and safety issues. Sure. Yeah, we're happy to still consider trying to find a solution for your issue with that as we go forward. Uh, we've got three questions here now. My thought, um, but there was a point that wasn't answered. Oh, I'm just asking that question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. There's something. Could you please respond to Matt's question about the ability of the model to, to correctly model yeah. the capacity of a yeah. Dutch style roundabout? Yeah. Because to me, that seems to be critical. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, we all we can. The software that's out there at the moment, all we can do is best look to reproduce a Dutch style roundabout within the modelling software as best we can. Um, it, it doesn't have an ability to, to drop in a Dutch style roundabout per se. Uh, we have to look at the best guidance we've got available in terms of Transport Research Laboratory, uh, look at that, look at what we've got with our modellers in terms of best replicating the kind of stuff that's been expected to be seen, and then put that into the modelling to best replicate it. There, there isn't this, you know, there isn't a software package out there that that accommodates um, this widely used in the UK uh, transport industry. Um, there may be in, 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 if you go to Holland, but I can't take a um, software package out with rules of um, how cyclist priority works with cars in Holland and, and put that into here and get expect that to be signed off Why in terms of health and safety. Why not? We've got cyclists. It, it doesn't matter about whether how ingenious Cambridge is, we have to work with the industry standards in terms of what we're taking forward in terms of adapting a design using the modeling software that's widely uh, been validated and is accepted in the industry as, as working. Um, we've done, you know, we're looking at the best we can, but I think there are wider issues about having an unregulated, uncontrolled roundabout here rather than it just being a Dutch style roundabout. I think there's better ability to have optimization through having some sort of signalisation at this junction, I think the results indicate, if you don't forget, what we're looking at, which prompted us to really look at this, is a doubling of journey time along Milton Road with elements in here. Now, even if there's a refinement of the model, a doubling is quite a significant difference in terms of the current situation um, that we're seeing. Um, so that even if there was a margin of error in there, there there's still a significant uh, delay that's occurring, which means more traffic outside your houses, which means more delay for people coming down. We're trying to take the do optimum, accommodate as best we can with what's available uh, to come up with a solution that, that maintains the ethos, essentially. Now, I think you have to look at the scheme as a whole, which when I get to the other end of the presentation, you'll be able to see. Um, obviously, we're focusing on the junctions at the moment, but you have to think of the scheme as a whole in terms of what it's looking to achieve. And I think, have a look at that, and then obviously, come back with comments based on that once you've seen it, see the whole situation. In terms of the visualisations that Chris showed you, which are hopefully you can see is trying to accommodate your vision of what's along the, the road as a whole. If I, uh, to stop us being here, you know, if we move on to the next one, yeah, sure. there'll be lots of other... Further question that has not been No, addressed. sorry. No, no, it, was all, it hasn't been answered. It's the one about the turning head. If, if Highworth Avenue is to be closed, can they have confirmation that the turning head a turning head will be put in there. There is, there is no issue. If we're closing highway avenues off, we can put a turning head in. There is no problem. As you can see, you just take away more. Some of the green space will go, and a turning head will put in its place. Um, that is that's not a problem. Now, just a, a question. These are a concept. These are not the final design. This is something we can take forward with you uh, into into a preferred solution. And the, the same is true of Drew Yeah. It's a concept. Yeah. The point is that this will all be up on the website and if people have further questions that they want to put to it, then they can actually do it directly to the city deal and get a, a response. But we've just got uh, no, Councillor Manning, agree. Ian Manning would like to ask a question and Councillor Nigel Gawthorne. Just being critical. And then we'll brief. move on to I think, Arby Wright. I think as residents we've got to recognise it's very difficult for a, a guy who's kind of, you know, an officer working with a certain remit where they've also been doing things in a certain way because we have those regulations within the UK to be expected to just immediately take on board what we're saying. But at the same time, I think it would be completely remiss not to stress this point 
about Matthews, what Matthew said essentially, because I was going to ask the same thing. If they do it in Holland, it can be done here. Yes. And what I think, I'm not asking you personally to answer, because I think it wouldn't be fair, but I think what you essentially need to say back to your boss is there's a reputational issue here, the WSP is a company. Mm -hmm. But if we are all saying, we are paying you, you, not you personally, we may be paying you a lot of money, I don't know, but we are paying WSP a lot of money to do a lot of work for us, then we will take that money somewhere else and pay a different set of consultants who can go to Holland and can find out the Holland model this stuff, because I'm sure they do. That said, I'm expecting to come around and go, yes, of course, we'll do it, because it's not, it's not my fault at the food chain. But there is a way to do it, and everyone knows what I'm about to mention. There is a way of, do, of doing this stuff that's completely outside of your modelling software, and that's we trial it. And you could trial that, that with, with your temporary materials, you could trial that model of roundabout, and we could prove with experimental materials. And I'm not expecting to say yes or no now, again, it's unfair, but there is a way you could try that out and prove whether it did or didn't work outside of the software. Right. Perhaps I'm missing something, but on the on the alternative option two, the, the um, modified. How does a, a southbound cyclist go navigate down part of them? Go north of Highway Highway. Perhaps could be south down. down. The signal is, are we talking uh, option? The last one, the one on the far right? Yeah, the last one. So you're saying if you're coming southbound down the old road, down the 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 road, Southbound, you would need to come along and stop, take the crossing over, oh, and then you'll be able to cross through. That's what I was missing. I mean, what well, I can say is, in terms of uh, WSP's reputation, I mean, we are obviously looking using industry sounding modeling uh, with our experts to best represent what's being put forward to us to help inform design going forwards. There are lots of regulations in terms of design and to through safety audits. We're trying to come up with a solution with you that uh, captures your elements of of the ethos of what you want to have, a boulevard of trees along the road, the accommodation of better cycling and walking, uh, whilst also maintaining a certain level of uh, capacity for vehicles along the road. Um, and we are using the modeling software as best we can that's available at Synergy Stands to do that. Uh, I'll just leave it at that point for now. Now we'll move on to Arbury Road and Union Lane. Thank you. Okay. So, Arby Road. So we have taken the two optimal design. Um, Matthew provided here, uh, was quite clear with the signal staging that he wanted to accommodate into the design. We have a uh, peak lane bus lane that comes in. Uh, there are difficulties in reality of how that would be signed um, in terms of how we accommodate that, in terms of how do we stop people using that uh, in their car, or how to know when they do or don't. Um, how do we mark that? Would that be, you know, you wouldn't want a gantry going across to indicating when the lane can or can't be used. How do we do that with signage that is not confusing? There's, there's issues that have got to be considered in terms of that. Uh, the other fact that many people wouldn't have considered when they looked at the design, obviously that stops uh, an ability to take a right turn into Arbury Road during the peak time, because that's dedicated to buses in this, in this scheme. That was intentional. Yes, okay, but uh, that's just to make people aware that that's obviously in there. Um, so we've used the staging that's been suggested, um, obviously got the bus lane being put in. Um, the level of staggering that's in here at the moment, um, that wouldn't be uh, achievable in terms of uh, manoeuvring of vehicles, except it's too tight to switch direction. So again, that's needs to be ironed out in terms of uh, some of the alignment and some of the footprint that's uh, with this junction. Um, so again, looking at this junction, um, what we're seeing is, uh, in terms of inbounds, we're seeing again almost uh, more than a doubling of queuing. Um, that's with, I guess, the bus priority that's there, uh, taking out that lane, leaving a single lane coming through. Um, so in the end, there's an increase there on Arby Road, we're seeing that as well. With a six stage uh, junction here, every time you have a stage in the signaling, that also takes away some capacity from the junction, adds a bit of extra delay. Because we've got a dedicated uh, pedestrian stage, cycling, 
and we've got the boss early release, that all kind of starts to add up in terms of delay within the junction. Um, you're again seeing um, on the Milton Road outbound, you're seeing an increase in queuing again uh, in the Duoctum, and you're seeing that on Union Lane. So in, in all aspects of this, this particular junction, we've had to relook at that in terms of how we can best uh, make, this, make this work. Um, what we've uh, come up with, I hope as you see, is not too dissimilar. What we've uh, suggested in the past solution is uh, to enable Union Lane to still remain open, but get some additional uh, movement to capacity, sorry, capacity within the junction. What we've done is we're looking, we're suggesting uh, a left hand turn ban coming out of Union Lane. Uh, when you just let me explain why that's for. So that enables in this scenario us to have less stages because what we can run the pedestrian stage here, the longest crossing for pedestrians, <coughs> at the same stage as uh, Union Lane because it can only go straight ahead or right. And that means that our all head stage is a lot shorter. So it means more time for uh, less to close down the junction to all kind of movements, which enables that, that better capacity to be maintained. Um, where we can, we've obviously put in dedicated cycle lanes to enable turns. You can see some of the shared surface here coming in in a, in a section which was uh, highlighting the LLF discussions that w there was a demand for, for shared surface here. Um, so what we've tried to do is try to accommodate as much of the cycle movements as we can while still maintaining the level of capacity uh, at this junction as best we can. This is the, when we've added all those vehicle queues, this is the difference that we're seeing. So the blue, again, is the current situation. Uh, the red is the do optimum, um, and the uh, purple is the modified do optimum, which I've just shown you. Um, so, again, if we go with the do optimum with the staging that's there in terms of the timings of the junction, we're looking at there will be a big increase in queues. We try to maintain the elements we can within designing a junction of this type um, with those elements, and therefore come with a modified option, which is an improvement on the current situation rather than a, uh, a Making it worse in terms of curing in the current situation. Good questions. Yes. Uh, just a couple of questions. Yes. I'm assuming in your scenarios you've moved the bus stop that is sort of just as you turn right out of the lane on the old road because some of that blocks a lot of traffic. Then, secondly, you've presented an option for a van left turn. Um, I know on the Elizabeth Way, Highworth Avenue one you've presented more than one option to look at. Did you, for example, look at uh, modifying traffic signals, so you're delaying them, or banning a right turn instead, which would make more sense than banning a left turn in terms of that? Um, so I wouldn't be hugely keen on that one. No. Right. Um, yes, Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, would it be a fair summary to say that all these junctions are actually worse for cyclists than they currently are. I mean, the Elizabeth Way one, we showed those of accidents on the roundabout, and the improvement is to have the same roundabout but traffic going fast, but the lot of consequence would seem to be faster cars hitting the same cyclists and having worse accidents. And then on Arby Road, you've got a cycle lane in between two lanes of traffic. I wouldn't be mad at thinking about my year seven child going down there. Right. Um, yeah. Sorry, I won't in due course. No, no, please. please. I just want to be clear that what we're being shown are these great long red lines, the increase for due optimum, that's all vehicles. But actually, who gives a toss about all vehicles? You're trying, this plan you tell us is to get the buses through quicker, and yet there's no modelling that shows what the achievement is on that Arby Road Junction, for instance, of, the, of getting the buses through with the head start uh, and the separate bus lane. I'm not comfortable that the modelling is, is a, in accordance with what's trying to be achieved by the whole of the City Deal plan.
what what is the level of bus travel that actually goes down Milton Road? Because I go down Milton Road quite a lot, and it's very rarely that I actually see a bus. But you, you put in a great deal of effort in dealing with the buses in all of these, and it, it, it just seems that you're putting too much focus on the buses when, when it's the other, it's the cars and the people and the cycles that, that are actually the big problem. How many buses are there? What are you looking at? What's the volume? Good, and now Jerry, you've got a question. Okay, my question is about being delay. No left turn out onto Milton Road. That's going to cause the problems, like we said originally, like even if you close it, with the high street in Chesterton. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get, no, the traffic's not going to wait there because they can't turn left. Mm -hmm. So then they're going to come all the way back into the high street. Block up the whole high street is blocked up now, and the buses have a hell of a job to get through. We're talking about buses, let alone cars, cycles, whatever. So that is not a good option. We should still keep the left turn. That takes a bit of the traffic away from the high street, and all the people that live off Union Lane can get out onto Milton Road. Helps them get to work or. Let's stop here and we'll watch those. So maybe if we do the one because um, Claire and Jerry have really asked the same thing about the left hand turn. So what we're trying to do is, so originally um, we looked at options of closing year lane, obviously that wasn't, that wasn't popular. Um, what we're looking to do is try and accommodate the change here. This is uh, that what I've said before about working with Arby Road and Elizabeth uh, Way Roundabout to try and improve some opportunities for optimisation here in terms of uh, enabling the junctions to work better together and simplifying the junctions to increase the capacity of these junctions where they have an impact on another. So one option of that is to limit the amount of uh, phasing or, or enable us to still maintain pedestrian and cycle crossings as much as possible whilst uh, optimising that within the signal staging of the junction. One option to do that is to remove the left turn, makes that simpler for, for Union Lane, so there's still access, it's still maintaining that, but it's kind of simplifying the junction to enable us to have additional capacity. If, I think with all these solutions, if we don't do anything really any different, we have all the movements we've got here at the moment. Um, as Charles said, obviously that decreases um, capacity or it decreases queuing. Um, maybe that isn't seen as a problem, but when we look at it as, as cumulative along the whole road, and that starts to add up to a doubling of journey time for vehicles to travel down this, this radial route, um, that becomes an issue. Um, so, as I say, these are concepts, this is something we're putting forward as a, one way to enhance the junction with some of the cycle lanes and uh, pedestrian priority we've seen in your Kyoto proposal, whilst still, still being able to accommodate um, an optimisation of the junction. Um, in terms of the gentleman saying he wouldn't want his daughter cycling on the uh, cycle lane, um, there's a shared use service uh, here as well. So what we've tried to do is for those less confident cycles or, or children, they can, they can cycle here. This is for your commuter cyclists. And I think one of the things you want to consider, there's you know, quite a few different types of cyclists that travel along uh, Nelson Road. You've got your kind of you know, professional or whatever you want to call them. Commuter cyclist who just wants to go and doesn't want to get entangled in, in, in mixing with pedestrians. And obviously you've got school children who are less confident and want to be kept away. And, and that's one of the things we're conscious of and we're trying to accommodate where we can. Um, sometimes there's, there's double priority for cyclists somewhere. So there's the, the kind of priority lane for those who just want to get going and uh, there's shared service for those that want to uh, are less confident on the road or, or need to be safer because so they're, they're children. <laughs> Two, two questions that really go to the bus issue that Charles was asking, is there any modelling being done on actually getting the buses through um, because the modelling seems... Yeah, so if I get to that point in the presentation, I can show you the difference that it makes to buses as a whole, along the whole scheme, in terms of the modify all these all these changes to the junction, what that means to buses. Um, Obviously, when we improve, um, what we haven't done at this stage in the modelling is looked at um, 
bus priority. So we wanted to see just what was going to occur in terms of just putting the bus lanes in, seeing what effect that had. We can put bus priority each. That when we've got signalisation, there's ability to, to give that extra priority to buses. That impacts on their capacity for other vehicles. Um, I think when we, we look at it as a whole, this saves enough journey time that we've got ability to play with it then to see where we can enhance bus uh, priority each of the junctions and still maintain sort of the current levels of journey time for uh, general traffic down Milton Road. Um, there was a general question about we see hardly any buses coming down, so why are we concentrating on buses? Okay, um, what we're looking at, as Chris has uh, said at the beginning of the presentation, we're not just looking for now, um, we're looking for 2031. Um, we've got Water Beach coming forward. I know some of these discussions we've had at the beginning of this presentation, but we need to provide people with the opportunity to not be in their vehicles, to, to give them as much public transport opportunities as possible. So it's not about just the situation today, it's about the future and be able to provide additional uh, capacity for buses or an enhanced frequency of buses down Milton Road to deal with the capacity that's going to want to travel into the city in the future. Um, just, um, Jerry's got a question, but I just want to say too that there was a proposal put forward in relation to Union Lane that we have staggered. Uh, yes, right yes. So we. And, and so, I mean, I, I think my own view is that if you have staggered lighting there, then at peak times, then you actually handle the matter without having to have a right to that turn ban or a left turn ban, and you get traffic out of. So we have we have looked at that. Um, we've looked at having some alternate staging. So uh, the Union Lane been made to wait longer to, before it's released. Um, I haven't shown those results, but effectively it's worse than the solution we put forward just because you have to have a dedicated stage of the signalling for Union Lane to have all those reasons rather than interweaving it with some of the pedestrian stages by banning the left turn. Uh, you know, probably getting into to the complications of how the junction works. But essentially we did look at that. It, it's not as optimum as the, the purple suggestion. It's, but if that's, you know, as I say, it's a sign concept, the elements we're putting forward as a whole uh, to, to improve the corridor as a whole um, and some of these elements can be, can be looked at as we go forward into well, the detail. Jerry, did you have any? Yeah, just going back to that, the way you're doing no left turn, so the bus, buses can get through as quick as possible. Yeah. Right, so in East Chesterton that means we're going to have to catch a bus an hour before we really want it, just so we can get out the East Chesterton because we've only got two ways of getting out. So you're blocking the left-hand turn out of Union Lane onto Milton Road causes big eruptions. You're not listening to what we're trying to say. Yeah. About the bus that live there. If, if, that it's... is an important issue. It's it, you're going to cause eruptions doing that. If, if we if we say we change went for an option where we um, limited the amount of times that Union Lane Junction was allowed to have traffic enter onto the junction. So people will get to know that Union Lane only triggers every second or third time that the junction timing comes around. The queue would start to build then as well, wouldn't it? And people would think to reroute in any case um, to alternative routes if they knew there was always going to be a case on the Union Lane being a queue. So I think what, wherever we look with this, we're going to have, uh, there's going to be some impact on the network. Um, it's trying to accommodate that. The aim here is to, on a minor road like Union Lane, we're trying to make to the benefit of, of Milton Road as a whole by min but minimising the impact on residents on Union Lane as much as possible while still being able to undertake a change. Well, I guess right. the one, if I could just say something here, one of the points here though is you're talking about a ban on left turns as if it's going to be forever. But there's an issue surely about peak time traffic and peak hour traffic and peak hour buses and that doesn't happen through the whole of 24 hours. Therefore, if you've got a ban, I'm not asking you to answer this now. I'm just putting it forward because it seems to me that I, we, you know, we want to get on and have as many questions as we can. But I think that has to be thought can about. Just, can I just briefly pick up Jerry's point to just try and make this a bit more positive? both ways, you feel like you're being massively attacked all the time, which I appreciate my, you know, if what you're saying is you disagree with Jerry, what Jerry's, <coughs> Jerry's point, then that is a really easy one where you, we could gain a lot of confidence as, as residents in the community. We could try all that and we could show who was right and we could show what the impact was and then rather than having these very theoretical debates about what the impact there was and whether, whether people like Jerry and I who know the community really well are right or whether your modelling is right, 
it will be a really easy one. It would build up a lot of confidence in this process, whether, whether if you did the trial and it disproved Jerry and I, or whether you did the trial and it proved you right, we'd still have a, you know, a much better, I think as residents, a much better confidence in going forward when you're, when you're saying things like, our modelling works, we'd say, well, actually, that time it did work. I mean, what we do... Yes. response to that. What's been proposed is there be, be trialling and that's something that would have to be thought about I think by the City Deal Board, not by the consultants, Mike, and then we'll go on to the next junction. Yeah, one of the things that hasn't been discussed here in terms of this banner on that term, obviously, is that people will then wrap run through the Hurst Park estate in order to go into town. Yes. So they'll go up a, um, the Arbury Road and turn into Lee's Road and Quite the way through the Hurst Park estate. Is your modelling looking at that? Is this proposal looking at that? Because one of the things we did say was we wanted mitigation maps to come uh, built into any scheme to stop rat running. As I say, this is an early design concept, so we haven't taken to the level of, of looking at what the mitigation might be outside of the corridor at this stage. We're trying to have a concept we can work forward in. Um, I'll take a point, as you're saying, about trialling. Um, Obviously, you've talked around uh, the kind of money that's being spent on this moment. What we aim to do with modelling, obviously, is to undertake modelling to uh, see what the, the impact would be without having to take physical measures necessarily, which are quite costly. Um, but that's not something that necessarily shouldn't go in trial, but obviously there's a cost implication from that. Um, and that's why modelling generally is used to give an estimate of what the impact will be before anything's committed on the ground. Um, so, just to say that. But, but I think the indication I've given is that's something that we could be suited. Right, well now we'll move on to the next um, junction, which, as I recall, is King's Tensions Road. Now I know, Matt, that you've got a lot of questions and I've been sitting here thinking that the solution is that we need to set up an actual dedicated meeting between you and the officers that would be a meeting that would not have any interruptions to it from anybody else, but would be you and the officers getting together to talk through your concerns yeah, about their concept. Mm -hmm. uh, because you said at some point that you, the exclusive walk uh, scenario, the exclusive walk phase could be shortened because you have that damn left turn. And I want to point out that that's not the case. Uh, first number one, the exclusive walk phase, uh, all directions green, was one of the most top features requested in all the meetings. That we so I made sure to include it, and that drove the rest of the design of the junction, uh, the all directions green uh, solution that's used in the Netherlands, for example. And so if you, but you can't shorten the all exclusive walk signal because the balance turn, because people will still try to walk across that arm of the junction, and all they have, they're gonna start trying to walk across the arm of the junction where you remove the crossing, mm -hmm. which is today an extremely busy crossing. Yeah. So I, I don't see how that's workable at all. Now, as, as Dawson suggested, I think if we're going to get out of here this evening, I think I'm happy to take more detailed offline chats with you about the you want knowledge, but uh, as well. I, I think otherwise we, we sorry guys, you probably and will, will be I here with I can't offer a better offer to you, Matt, than to say you can have a dedicated meeting with officers. I think that that actually is a really good solution and it's a really open offer. And so you will have your dedicated meeting with the officers when you can talk through all these issues, which will be a dedicated meeting that doesn't have any interruptions from anybody else at all. And now I'll call the 10 minute break because I think that we actually need a break at this stage. Well, I appreciate that very much. I just, the reason why I'm asking it openly is because I want people to hear the discussion, at least some of the yes, points yes, like this yes, one, yes, which yes, are really important. Thank you, Journey time goes to 26 minutes or 29 minutes, 
then traffic will go another way. And that was the point, that was the context of the point that I made. My apologies, old age just crept on, and I forgot that it was actually 26 minutes ago. Thank you very much for that um, clarification. So let's have a break, actually for five minutes, I think, and then we'll come back. Thank you. And we'll do, deal with the King's Hedges intersection. Thank you. Hello. I think that we should return because we've got to be out of the building by, that, by 9 o'clock. So if we all come back, please. And in this interim, I will say, I just have the information to respond to your question, Richard. The meeting of the 6th of July is an absolutely open meeting, so we'd be really pleased if you come along with your video camera and video the whole thing. It's a general meeting, an open meeting of the City of Good. I've just been informed it may not be the 6th of July, but whatever it is or whenever it is, it is an open public meeting. So rest assured, Richard, we can have you there with your video camera. Good. Yes, so let's get going. And we're now going to deal with the King's Hedges intersection. So I will hand over again to Neil Fulton to continue. Who's doing a sterling job? My going to carry out if we get to nine o'clock, uh, just to uh, lighten the mood if you hear a wet free one. Oh, if it's angels, then yes. Um, okay, so to continue, um, so just to recap, um, on, on all these, we're obviously looking at the junction at a time, but please bear in mind we're looking at the scheme as a whole. When we put it together, we've seen it. We're seeing a doubling of journey time, and that's what we're trying to get past in terms of the suggestions we're putting forward and alternatives. Just to, just to set the scene, really, in terms of why we're looking to make these changes. We're not making them for making the sake, because we've, we've modelled the do-optimum, and, and the indication is there's, there's a doubling of journey time. So we're looking to how we accommodate as best we can, whilst not enabling that sort of extra delay to be built into to Melton Road. Right, so... King's Hedges. So, just to, um, again, we're looking, uh, there's two suggestions that were put forward in the uh, Duoptum. There was a Dutch style roundabout and there was a signalisation of the junction. So, um, hopefully, on one of these we can come to an agreement on more so than the others. Um, again, we've got the same issues uh, as, we, as we've talked around. The, the difference here is obviously the Elizabeth Way is a roundabout at the moment um, and here it's a signalisation. So when you generally take a signalised junction and return it to a roundabout, regardless of whether that's a Dutch style or whether that's a standard roundabout, um, if there's an imbalance of flow, so if there's a lot of traffic trying to come across Milton Road, um, these other arms on a roundabout may not get a look in um, to particularly say if there's AMP running across here or PIMP or outbound running across those people trying to get out of those lesser junctions with lesser amounts of traffic really don't get necessarily get a look in into the junction. So just to set the scene for that, if it's an imbalanced junction. That's exactly what we're seeing on here. So although we're seeing improvements on the other arms, as you might expect, because now it almost becomes free flow, uh, so we don't have a massive amount of, of demand coming from Green and Road, but we're getting a lot of free flow coming through here, so that's great. We've seen that, um, benefits, um, or certainly benefits coming in on the AM and the PM, but not going out as a bit of additional queue. But the issue becomes on King's Hedges Road, it's just not getting the ability to, for those vehicles to access onto the junction. And that would generally occur, I mean, it's, I think it's heightened because of the Dutch style uh, roundabout, but we're seeing that anyway. Um, so based on, you know, this is increasing from around 10 uh, metres of, of queuing to 60, it's quite a significant increase, six times of, the increase. So I think whatever we look at here, we need to look at it in a signal sort of uh, capacity rather than in, in, a, in an uncontrolled roundabout. So what was put forward as the other option in the do optimum was a signalised um, is a signalised uh, junction with improved pedestrian um, spacing, um, increased green, green space, and we've tried to replicate. And hopefully uh, you can recognise the, the you know that within this junction we've tried to replicate as best we can whilst also taking on board. Uh, highway design standards, um, 
to replicate essentially that design um, as best we can. With it can't be taken as close as, as this is indicating. It's just not possible with the with the vehicle turns that need to be accommodated. Um, but otherwise, this is almost as, as good a replication as we can of the signalised junction that we can we can accommodate. Um, what we see here then is. Um, the blue is the current situation, the red is the due optimum, and the purple is the modified. Um, the difference of why, obviously, we've seen with the um, due optimum scenario, because it's, it's, it's brought in um, that more on there's a, um, a sort of tightening of the junction, um, we're not seeing the benefits we'd like to see. What, in the one we've designed, which is tries to better replicate kind of the, the highway standards and the movements that would need to be accommodated in the junction, we've still got a lot of the benefits that are there in terms of uh, the cycle of pedestrian movements. Um, but what we've done is also, we've got these long sections of crossing. That means we have to allow more green time pedestrians to cross. And that's why you're seeing that being a slight disbenefit, uh, slightly longer queues than you'd have in the current situation at the moment it's staggered for that pedestrian crossing so um, in having that continuous crossing that's better people don't have to get halfway and then wait again but uh, in doing that there's a slight disbenefit in terms of the optimization uh, in terms of vehicle uh, capacity going through the junction so um, it, again it's that balance that's balance coming through so hopefully of all those uh, that is the one that hopefully um, all we feel most yeah you will hopefully be happiest with um, in terms of what your vision looks like when it comes to reality and trying to accommodate that for you. Right. We've now opened questions, and Matt, you go first, because I stopped you last time, please. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, please. Sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, come back to the roundabout uh, diagram for a moment, please. Thank you. Also, uh, thank you, Neil, for going through all this. I didn't say that before. <laughs> no. uh, the, Okay, so uh, again, it does appear that the modeling software is having some issue with this type of roundabout. Though I will say, that, to be fair, this one is smaller than the Highway Avenue Junction. Highway Avenue Junction is much larger in space. Um, I talked with Richard Ferrer Best about uh, roundabouts, and he was pretty happy with what he saw. Uh, he did suggest that this one could use a larger island, so that is something to take into account. I looked into whether that could be done, and yes, it at least within the constraints that I had used. Uh, we can talk about you know, specific details later. Uh, the, uh, let's see, can you go on to the next uh, drawing? The uh, next slide, sorry. Uh, King's Hedges Road. Matt, is there a question? Just so yeah, we're... okay. Um, <coughs> basically, I think my point stands, we, we still have the same, the same issue with, uh, with uh, modeling and, and uh, can I just ask a question about the, the, jun the uh, signalized junction design that you put forward? What's the uh, timing plan here? Uh, how do you get people across uh, this junction and, as you said, the longer distances? So the, so the longer uh, all green stage uh, for pedestrian movements uh, within here to enable those movements to occur. So, so it's, it's essentially the same timings as we've got in the current junction at the moment, essentially the same staging, but we've increased the um, green time as well for the pedestrian movements. When, um, the, when does the pedestrian movement happen and when does the cycle movement happen? Does it happen in an exclusive phase or is it... Again, if we're going to have a meeting, I'm happy to talk through the details, but um, in terms of going to try to keep it higher level at the moment rather than getting into the detail stages, but we can have that sort of discussion at some point. Right, now we'll have three more questions. Yes, they're in the purple shirt and Anna, and is there another person who'd like, oh yes, yes, down there. Good, so one, okay, two, or three. Okay, my question, um, from the data that you've just shown us, there is only one disadvantage in the Dutch Star roundabout, is those people trying to gain access from King's Edge Road. Yeah, you go back, but that, that, that's the only issue, is it? Uh, well, you've got the results in front of you there. So we've got a massive amount of queue. We could, the modeling is indicated the King's Edge Road will have a, a, a large amount of queue. Is that, simple, that, that the, um, the problems with King's Edge is simply in the, in the peak time in the morning. So if, if that yeah, Dutch style roundabout was um, traffic light control for the peak hour, yeah. that would address that problem. But for the rest of the day, avoiding the two peak hours, if it was the, the, the lights will turn off, it would then run itself yeah. without any issue 
So just for those two peak hours, morning and evening, it could be light controlled. The rest of the day, it could then run itself, and we all know that a roundabout will run at up to about 150% of its supposed capacity. It's just the way it works. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask if you could just explain what is the benefit of uh, making it one long crossing rather than having the island in the middle? Is it simply to give the extra lane? Because it would seem to take longer to get pedestrians across that very long yeah. crossing. Well, I just explain that. Good. And then there was a third question. Yes. Okay. Uh, it seems to me that all I've seen today is all about car priority, not particularly bus priority or walking priority or cycling priority uh, the whole of the time. And you're talking about cars the whole time. And yet, what will actually happen is that uh, you actually haven't put in anything about uh, the controlled parking zones that are going to come in. Uh, the workplace levies, uh, some way maybe to go around the centre of the city so the cars won't be coming in. Um, why are they actually coming down Milton Road when they can't get through to Addenbrooks or somewhere else? Yeah. And we also need to do something about sat now so that when people are coming from Water Beach and they want to go to Addenbrooks, they are given a different direction to yeah. go instead of coming straight across. Three questions then. There was the issue about the peak hours and light controls only at peak hours. So, um, yeah, if you wanted a signalised roundabout here, you would have to have a very different design. You can't uh, take a concept like Dutch and it, the design of it would change. When you put in signals, you have to have stop lines change for a different distance. Uh, the whole kind of way you design the junction, so you, you can't um, cherry pick elements you want from different elements, have different styles and put them all together. Um, we also have kind of regulations in terms of what's been taken forward in the past. I'm not aware of a signalised Dutch junction maybe in that is. You've ridden through them in, in the UK? No, not in the UK. But, um, so we have different, different rules in terms of what we can accommodate. Um, and as I said, uh, regardless of its um, a, a Dutch style or a, just a normal roundabout, we're seeing a disbenefit, well, an inability for King's Hedges traffic to come onto the junction, which will have their knock on effects around the network. Um, so that hopefully I've uh, answered that. Uh, <coughs> issue about one long crossing versus. One long crossing. So um, the, 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 the crossing is, is, is purely, yeah, it's purely there to, um, for the benefit of cycling, for pedestrians. So it's rather than you having to take part of your crossing and then, and cycling, yeah. Um, cyclists, um, so it's for that benefit that you're, uh, you can you can wait till that point and then you get to undertake a journey to the crossing in one. What I meant was, does it take longer to cross over one long crossing than it does to do half and half? Yes. Uh, uh, no, it would, it, it's quicker for you to cross over because you don't have to stop, wait for another set of signal timings and then for you to take your other half of the journey. So it's quicker for you as a pedestrian, but it takes longer for that. For the slower. stage, and it's slower for the track. That's why you're seeing that disbenefit to traffic slightly from changing that, that factor. And then there's the issue about we seem to be on about car priority here rather than bus, cycling, and pedestrians. And what about all the other proposals? Yeah, I mean, if, if I may mean to get to the end of the presentation, and when I do, um, I'm going to show you the whole scheme, and then uh, hopefully you can see in the context of that that we've accommodated cycling, buses vehicles, all users, but I think you have to, we're looking at the junctions at the moment. I think, look at the whole scheme and then see what you think at that point. Um, in terms of what we can model, we're, generally that is focused around vehicle um, movements, and what we're aiming to do is maintain the current levels of um, traffic delay, um, average journey time, not make them uh, mass, so to not double the journey time, essentially, down this road. We're trying to either make it as it is at the moment, or, okay, there could be a slight disbenefit, but not to the extent that we're seeing from the modelling in terms of what we're, we're, when we put the Jorts in its entirety into the model. Right. Well, let's um, now move on then to the end, because we do have... Sorry, for one moment. We do have to talk about the future engagement of the LLF with this concept, as they say, and... Um, 
I did also want to make it clear at this stage that both the representatives of the Residents Association, Michael Page and Charles Nisbet, are meeting with the City Deal Board on the 15th, that is on Thursday, to actually talk through this whole issue. So I just wanted to assure residents that this is at the end of the process and there is this special meeting that will be had with your particular residents representatives that will give them an opportunity to actually argue for do optimum with the with the board or to <coughs> submit to put issues to the board. But if you go on deal with the Okay, so just to conclude then um, on the presentation. So with all those changes that we put together, just a reminder, so this is uh, the situation of journey time, so this is average journey time along Milton Road. In the current situation, well the model showing will be a doubling in the AM peak on the do optimum, and therefore if we put the modified do optimum in, in, in its entirety, then we're seeing a benefit to the current situation. And that extra capacity we have there, we have then have the ability to play further around with bus priority, so which will impact on general vehicle um, times on average journey times, but we could also probably level off to this, the current situation was giving extra priority to buses. In terms of what we're doing with bus lanes, this is just to put in context for you. I mean, the current, uh, I know people feel that they don't see buses uh, travelling down the busway, and, but uh, what I've tried to indicate to you is um, if we took them away, um, and I know there is some small elements of bus lanes in there and bus priority, there has been some consideration to do optimum, but in general bus lanes are taken out for the, for the majority of the length. Um, if we strip those out, I think I've, I've, what I've tried to indicate to you is that there's, a, there's a doubling and a, a greater variance, a doubling in journey time buses, so it's less incentive for people to take buses, and there's greater variance in their ability to travel down Milton Road, which means that the timetable is, is not able to be kept here. What we're suggesting in the modified to do optimum is essentially only an extra 240 metres of, of bus lane. So we're not trying to dominate the space of bus lanes. What we're trying to do is uh, better use the bus lanes where we can in terms of splitting them so they're not on both sides of the road but optimising it in terms of what, and when you see the final scheme in a minute you can see where we've, we've moved them from one side of the road to other. Um, at the moment the modeling doesn't include for hurry calls or junctions or priority at the junctions which is something else that we're going to be looking at. As I said it's the concept we're looking to take forward and we're just trying to, I'm just trying to indicate you this side that we're not adding to dominate the space, we're just trying to not let, reduce the bus lanes from the current situation. That's uh, something that, that would uh, not be acceptable to uh, the council in terms of a, a, an objective to make bus priority uh, a better along, along the, the Who road. Who says so? It was bus priority, not bus lane. The, well, it's still the same situation. If we take out the bus lanes that are there at the moment, there'll be a worse situation for buses travelling down Milton Road. I don't think that the managing director of the bus company here wants bus lanes all the way. We have had a, a meeting with Andy, and we have talked through where he would where he would like to have them, and that's been accommodated with the design. So we've uh, fully consulted with Andy uh, Campbell on, on where he would like to see uh, bus priority. And what we also need to consider is we're talking around the current situation, not the future situation, where we're going to have a lot a greater use of buses. Anyway, moving on, so we can finish the, the presentation. Here we go again. So we're looking at, again, bus, this is what I'm trying to talk around, the bus reliability. Uh, this in, so again, in outbound, we're seeing um, current situation. Um, there's not a massive amount of uh, change, but that's because there's not a lot of bus line here at the moment. We don't have so much on the outbound, because that's not uh, where the biggest experience and the biggest, biggest issues, but the um, modified uh, do optimum does, does make an improvement. What we do see though on the AM, so this is inbound into the city in buses, uh, the current situation, uh, that's the average, that's the variance, this is the issue which would be uh, situated with if we do the optimum, and therefore where we put in the bus loads of name to optimise them, we're seeing a benefit over the current situation, which is what we're aiming to achieve, and that would likely uh, increase once we put uh, hurry calls and other uh, priority movements into the signalisation um, of, of the junctions. Um, so what we've aimed to do, although uh, I know there's a lot of other um, opinions, is try to look at the design considerations and make sure that a do optimum scheme is modified to meet all of them. So does it meet all the project objectives? We believe the, uh, the modified uh, suggestion we're putting forward does. Uh, does the design provide sufficient infrastructure to improve bus journey times reliability? We believe it, it meets that. Would it perform safely? We believe that we've designed it uh, in terms of the junctions where, where it has a better... Uh, but it's
do that. And it's compatible with design guidance and standards, which the do optimum uh, we've obviously looked to try and accommodate, but wasn't in its design as it was presented to us initially. Um, key layers are most suitable in achieving the right balance, and it is that balance between traffic delays and improved bus journey times. That's what we're trying to do. And does it fit within the highway boundaries and existing drive accesses, which um, again the do often didn't consider and we've we've aimed to consider in terms of what we do. So where does that leave us? So this will be online, um, so you have the uh, ability to look at this. Obviously, we're not looking, asking you to uh, make your decision or, or be able to take it all in at this moment. But what we've presented, therefore, we're going to do is provide a design concept to you um, at this stage, um, which, if agreed um, in, the, in terms of a concept by the Citadel Board, <coughs> detailed design will then be taken forward to work it up with the LLF and with stakeholders. So we're looking for a base in which we can uh, move from. Please note, in terms of what I'm going to show you now, elements we haven't considered this time are in terms of bus stop locations, because we do that in consultation with yourself and the stagecoach. Additional pedestrian crossings outside the junctions. Again, that's something we're happy to discuss with you and identify where those would be. And detailed parking schemes, we've given an indication. Um, but obviously we need to do uh, further work in terms of that with officers and, and, and uh, experts in the LLA. Uh, so what we've produced is essentially um, the do optimum scheme is, is the below and then our do modified scheme is above. And what we've aimed to present to make it as easy as possible for comparison is to try and match the style that's been presented. So they're both kind of indicative. The trees, we have looked at where we can put trees based on where the drive access. I know we're not showing the access, so we don't want to clutter it up. But what we've done is shown where we could probably accommodate trees. But I'm not guaranteeing in you that exactly that's where a tree is going to be. Obviously, this is just an indication. So on each stage of the um, of Milton Road, in terms of the residents, in terms of the do optimum, we've got a comparison with what we're proposing as a modified do option uh, along the section of the road. We've identified where we've got options for further consideration, where it's, say, for example, Elizabeth Way. Um, so we've taken each section and we've done a direct comparison to make it as, as transparent as possible in terms of what we're suggesting would work uh, in terms of accommodation of, of the engineering work we've done and the modelling work uh, in trying to replicate what you've put forward and trying to meet the objectives in terms of accommodating bus lanes while still accommodating the elements of your design. Um, so that, that's there for the entirety. That will be available online for you to view um, and that will hopefully give you a full picture of what we're able to, we feel we're able to justify coming forward with uh, based on the modelling, based on the engineering work we've done to date for this concept, in terms of something that could work to meet all demands on Milton uh, Road, in comparison to yours. So hopefully, it, it obviously has to be different. Uh, they can't, we can't put the do-optimum in its entirety, just purely in terms of some of that design elements don't work, uh, when you're trying to put it into the real world, in terms of, say, particularly the junctions of the turning movements, etc., in terms of tracking vehicles. So we've got a concept here to put forward to have a direct comparison. So bear that in mind. In doing that, look and see where you can see, you know, it's not just about spot the difference in terms of other elements, it's about consideration of where we, you can see how it's, how this is very different to a do something or do maximum design that's come before, this is very much trying to match with the deal flow as best we can. Thank you. Now, there's three questions so far. Richard Taylor, then Hilary Boy, and then Anna Bradman. Thanks. On the introduction to the section on the Milton Road and Elizabeth Way roundabout section, you gave us a slide which showed um, incidents and I think you mentioned um, injury statistics and said that that was going to be modelled. So are we going to see the results of the modelling of um, injuries and show um, what you expect the rate of injuries and deaths to be of your proposals versus the do optimum um, plans? Just to, if I could just answer that, we, well, I didn't say we were going to model, I don't believe I said that we were going to model accidents. What I was indicating there is that we um, mapped all the accidents that have occurred so far from the police data, um, and therefore we've got that in consideration as highway designers when we design something. So in the solution we come up with, both the signalisation generally um, does, um, because you're, you can have a uh, you know, allow cyclists to go before um, other traffic. Generally, when you signalise uh, either a roundabout or we went for the, the three arm T junction, we aim to have a better safety record. But there's no, we can't have got the ability to model uh, uh, what accidents might be because of the random nature generally of accidents. You obviously look at the, you look at the history, you look at um, what's occurred with accidents in the past, and you try to learn from that to identify where the black spots are, the junction, or where, where the issues are, and you try to accommodate in that design. So there's no ability for us to. Um, kind of model that and indicate to you what an accident record would be in the future and in these junctions. Right, well now, let's 
I'm going to I've, I've got Hillary on the list and Anna. Is there one other person who'd like to? Uh, yes, uh, Matt. And we'll have those three questions, and we won't have any answer until we have the three questions. That, so please, Hillary, then Anna, then Matt. Thank um, you. How many buses have you seen using the bus lane in comparison with the ones that go down the main carriageway? Right, okay, so buses are not using the bus lanes, I think the suggestion is, so will they use them if we put in new bus lanes? Right, um, Anna, sorry. Okay, um, bear with me, I'll try to make this as succinct as possible. In the modified do optimum summary, broadly speaking, my understanding is you have tended to put bus lanes back in or retain them. Fine, okay, I appreciate why you're doing that. But in those bar chart data, the do optimum purple bars sh simply show one set of data for the result of that. But there's actually, we don't care two hoops if cars are queuing for longer, because actually we want that, don't we? Yeah. We want to stop people using their cars. We want to get them onto the buses. So actually, what I wanted to ask is in the modelling, is there any distinction between the resultant speed of the bus lane versus the resultant speed of the vehicles? Right. No. Can you answer that now? Otherwise we'll lose track of what no, the No, no, we won't lose track of it, no. We're, and we're going to have Matt. Um, I just want to make a clarification to the audience and then I'll ask the question, a technical question. Not that technical. Um, I just want to say in the Netherlands they're actually replacing signalized junctions with roundabouts because the modern design is both safer and higher capacity yeah. than, the, than the old style and, all the, and dense signals. As much as possible. Sometimes you can't do that. But where you can replace them, you do. Uh, number, and then the question is, can you please clarify what a bus hurry call is for the audience, mm -hmm. and then I have a follow-up question immediately after that, if that's okay, Jocelyn, because the second part of my question hinges on that. Okay, right, well now the business about uh, how are we going to get the buses to use the bus lanes if they're not using them now, um, with um, the issue about cars, we want cars to be queuing, and the, uh, do, does the model show that buses are getting through more quickly but that we hope cars are not. <coughs> so the, the, the message um, I'm getting is quite clearly is uh, people don't like bus lanes um, on, on Milton Road. I understand that. Um, but, um, but you're happy for queuing of vehicle traffic to increase. Uh, I guess it comes down to are you happy if it, if we're, obviously the modelling is an estimation of what would occur. If, if uh, it occurred and there was a doubling of journey time, a doubling of, of queuing on Milton Road, is it, so, you know, if that occurred, would, you, would that be acceptable to you, I guess? Would yes. you be happy to see that? Yes, because it would get people under the bus. Well, well, but then, to do that, so if we're saying that we're going to increase, uh, we're happy for vehicle queues to increase exponentially and, and a doubling to occur, then how do we, how do we um, therefore, enable buses to have that priority? Because otherwise they'll be stuck in traffic. We need to have to have more bus lanes, because we have to have a separate lane for them to travel in that isn't in the vehicle lane, because the vehicle lane will be... So it's a balance, isn't it? If we're not going to have a lot of extra bus lanes, then we've got to be able to enable the buses to move in general traffic when it's not in a bus lane. But your modelling does, but does your modelling distinguish between the results for the vehicle lane and the bus lane that you have proposed in your modified do Yeah, so in terms of the difference at the moment, so these are outline um, modelling at the moment, and we haven't got for 2031. For 2016, the indication is you get... So this is for every passenger, so you imagine... Yeah, for now, but we're looking for the future as well where there'd be an improved benefit because likely the traffic would increase. So if you think on each bus, it's 76 people on each bus. So, so I want to get the magnitude of the kind of the change that's also occurring. So if you've got 10 buses an hour and you've got them coming down and there's 76 people, there's obviously a lot of people that are getting affected by this. It's about a two minute journey saving is indicated at the moment in terms of what you might see uh, from this initial in the current day, but we haven't got the future year figure in terms of what that would be. Good, and now the response to Max. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Bus hurry call is essentially it detects that the bus is there and it, it um, brings forward the stage in which it brings a green light for the bus. So it knows the bus is there and it will change the uh, signal timing to enable the bus to uh, rest with the junction. And 
And then my follow-up to that is that the duoptimum proposal relies on that feature for its plus priority mechanisms. So if that wasn't the model... That is model. That is in, that's the results I presented to you that has that element in. What I'm saying is not in our... In terms of the modified, we haven't included it in ours. So in terms of the duoptimum modeling I've shown you, that has got that in. But all I'm saying is in terms of ours, we've only just put the bus stones. We haven't... In terms of what I've shown you in terms of the modified duoptimum results, we haven't at the moment put any hurry calls or... Thank you, or Okay, thank you. Thank you. Have you answered my question? Have you seen buses I have seen buses use the bus lanes on Melton Road, yes. Right, their question's been answered now. I've got a question for, sorry, I've got a question from uh, Councillor Martin Smart and the, and, and the question from here in the blue shirt and that's the end of the questions, I'm sorry, but we have to move on to what the future is of the LLF in this engagement and then we have to move ourselves out of the building. So, Martin first and then the gentleman in the blue shirt. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the lead council for cycling in the city, so there's a cycling related question. So, my question is um, you seem to be talking about uh, the do optimum scheme being modified for health and safety reasons and such like these cars. With the cycling, as far as I can see, or well, it's difficult to see the differences, you've pretty much taken the do optimum scheme, and a lot of the cycling happens behind the trees, away from the road, which is what do optimum wanted to happen. So, I mean, my question is like a rhetorical read, so I'm sure you've done it, but have you checked that that's all going to work functionally and safely in terms of cyclists, being able to, cyclists and you have referred earlier to having lots of different cyclists on mm -hmm. the road, cyclists being able to use that system. And what I'm particularly concerned about is cyclists choosing to use the road as opposed to the cycle lane, yeah. cyclists moving fast along the cycle lane and bumping pedestrians and some of the people they'll be next to, yeah. trees um, bashing into buses because they're right next to the road mm -hmm. and such like. So have you considered all those factors to ensure that the scheme works? Right, so. stop please. The question. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I see I really just want to make an observation so maybe you want to answer the question now. Oh no, please have your observation. Okay. Um, so I'm Edward Lee, it's not a game of transport. Um, I, I have to say, uh, to start with, I really, really appreciate the effort <coughs> that you and your team have made in trying to accommodate um, residents um, and cycling campaigns um, interest in this. Uh, but I, I really think you've been given an absolutely impossible task. You are not going to be able to satisfy both city deal objectives and residents' desires. And that's abundantly apparent because in putting back the bus lanes, uh, you have ended up having to compromise the cycling infrastructure to the point where it is not an end-to-end -end safe experience. And that's what we really need. Yeah. We want to be getting people taking their young children to school or making those short trips to the shops and so on. And actually, one thing, and this is really an observation for, for Councillor Herbert here, who's chair of the City Deal Board, is that actually one of the objectives that was missing in the original brief was to maximise modal shift to walking and cycling as a high possibly the highest priority. We have no idea what the potential of that is, but it, it is, a, it is a plausible that it's in the order of 10%. And that is enough to decongest the road by itself. Now, if we follow through that, uh, that objective, and we say, okay, well, we, that will reduce the capacity of some of the junctions, it will reduce the capacity of the road. We're still gonna get buses through, and that's a perfectly reasonable other objective to have, but we don't wanna hold the buses up. The conclusion from that is that we have to reduce the volume of other traffic using the road. Now, if we set those original objectives, we would now be thinking, okay, how can we achieve that objective? And if we were to achieve that objective, and we've got a number of, 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 of proposals on the table, including inbound flow control to regulate the flow of traffic at the top of the road, putting in a, a bus cycle bypass from the park and ride through the back, through this bridge, um, a, a tunnel under the A14 behind the, the regional college that could connect the park and ride by bus and cycle straight into the back of the regional college and King's Hedges Road. That would be a very attractive route for people to cycle, avoiding either, either crossing the A10 or, or going across the interchange. Um, and also all of the city centre access study is all about you know, reducing the parking availability and, and reducing the, the desirability of driving through the city centre. We would be looking at that now because we have decided that that's the priority, to reduce the amount of through traffic. And, and we just said we've ended up having wasted 
probably the best part of a million pounds, or maybe no, half a million pounds on this particular project, on, on coming up with a solution which nobody's happy with. It's not going to satisfy, it's not going to really meet the city's objectives, and it's not going to satisfy residents and the people who are trying to get into the city from outside. So we've fundamentally failed because we started out with the wrong brief, the wrong objectives. <laughs> Sorry, could you remind me of the... the yes. Um, the, we seem to have been concentrating on the, the need for modification to ensure health and safety in relation to the car movements and so on. Yeah, in terms of, in terms of cycling. So, um, essentially, we've, it's a design concept. We've tried to adapt it to an extent, but we, as you say, we've tried to mirror what the residents would like to see coming forward. When we take this into kind of more of a detailed design, we go through a safety audit stage, which we haven't gone through at, at this extent. And some of these elements that, where we have got a lot of drive accesses coming out, um, and, we, and we are proposing some of these elements broadly, so broadly we're happy that um, something could be put forward like this, but we know to go through safety audit uh, a number of stages of that to check whether it really is safe. So uh, this is a concept, so we haven't got until we've got more detailed design to actually test the safety. I appreciate some of the concepts we need to be more comfortable with so if we're going to pursue that. Um, but at the moment, we're, ge we're generally happy that this could be done, but obviously each time there's going to be, each access point even, there's going to be a, a specific case in point in terms of what the land, whether there's bushes for that driveway that maybe we, we can accommodate at the moment. Other elements that might obscure cyclists that obviously, you know, really broad scheme we've, we've not, not completed or been able to consider. So there are some of those elements we'd have to go forward with, with doing to make sure that everybody obviously people are safe in using these areas. But what we're trying to try to do is, is reflect what residents have asked us to kind of provide. In terms of the trees and buses, that's that's kind of another reason why putting a wholesale, obviously keeping the same look of the of the avenue of trees down and down and planting them in a better situation in which they can grow and, and survive and be healthy and, and that gives an opportunity when you're doing any scheme we put in would disrupt the current trees and obviously then we could put trees which maybe wouldn't have such a big crown and, and will be you know, designed in style they grow to not be impacting the buses. I think that we now should say a big thank you to Neil and to Chris um, for having done the presentation this evening. Thank okay. you. to um, Richard Paul, 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 sorry it's been a long evening, um, who is going to, he's a project manager on the, the council side, he's going to talk through the next stages. Okay. Thank you, I'm Paul van der Bolk, the project manager for the Northern Road Scheme and the Eastern Road Scheme, and a uh, fairly newish project manager on the scheme, so obviously my experience of the last little lesson tonight, I understand that there's uh, quite a formidable task ahead. In terms of the, uh, I'm just going to have a, just going to quickly run through the uh, future program. Click it on. So obviously we've had the LLF tonight. Uh, we now have a couple of meetings. Uh, we're going to meet with Matthew Benish to to go over the go over the scheme, uh, get a few of his points, and there's also a chance, obviously, following this evening, for you to submit uh, comments and observations to the City Deal. Uh, email address which we can provide after the meeting. Uh, we have to then complete the report which is going to go to the board. Uh, on, when, the, when the report is actually published, which will be on the 7th of July, uh, we will hold a public briefing session. Uh, we haven't yet finalised the date for that, but can I say it? Yeah, there was a problem. We were going for the sixth, but it's clashing with other meetings. Yeah, so we're and looking. People won't be able to be here. So we're looking, perhaps, for the Monday after the publication of that report for a public, uh, for a stakeholder briefing session. It was. What date is that? Tenth. Tenth. Can I just clarify? You just said public and then stakeholder. Which? Sorry, I remember it was a stakeholder briefing, but Jocelyn has stated it would be a public briefing session. So which is correct? No. It's public stakeholders. Public stakeholders, but the public will be able to come to the meeting. Yeah. Uh, we then have the assembly, uh, which leads up to the executive board on the 26th of July, when the report will be submitted, and the resolutions will go, also go before the board. Uh, 
Um, if the board agree to the concept, and again reiterate that it is a concept, uh, then through the summer and the autumn we'll go through the detailed design stages. Uh, we'll have LLF design workshops uh, to inform the design of the trees, and in those workshops we'll also have uh, city, Cambridge City tree officers, uh, other experts to help us inform the design. Uh, and we'll have uh, LLF design workshop and bus stops and crossings, as, as has been mentioned by Neil earlier, to basically make sure that we take on board what you say uh, and get those in the right places. Uh, then, well, we haven't actually got any dates yet, but further LLF meetings are required. Put that up, put, put that up because we will obviously have LLF meetings when, when we feel there's a need to hold them. Early in 2018, uh, the executive board we will consider the detailed design uh, and then following that we'll have a full public consultation on, on the approved detailed design so there'll be another opportunity to engage with the public and to, to, to hear your feedback on the scheme. Okay, so I think that's, that's the future programme. Jocelyn, thank you. Good. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you. And um, just to conclude the meeting, I have here a document that sets out the question process for both the Assembly and the Board, so those who wish to uh, make sure they get their questions in on time and so forth, please come and get one of these documents that sets out the process. Uh, and remember that the Assembly meets and then the Board meets a week later and there is an opportunity for questions via this process. But please do make sure also that if you're asking questions, coordinate with each other so that there's lots of time when we can get feedback from the Board as to, and the Assembly as to the Assembly's view of our resolutions and do optimum and the Board's response then to our resolutions and do optimum. But just remember, as Paul has emphasised, this is not the end of the process and there will be opportunities for us to engage, as Paul has pointed out, um, in, in the future going forward, as they say, of the process. I just want to make a personal comment too. A couple of times during this meeting, I may have been observed texting. I certainly was not tweeting, I was texting, and it was because both Claire and I were supposed to be at another meeting at 8 o'clock, we're clearly not there, and I did want to do the right thing uh, and advise the people that we're still here, not there. Okay, I just want to clarify like that, so there's no misunderstanding. So thank you very much to everybody for coming, and thank you so much for the engagement, for the questions. I'm sorry there was not more just, time for it. Can I just clarify, what, what is the decision that's being made being asked to be made at the assembly and the executive board. Because the decision is between the principles of the do optimum scheme and the principles of the modified do optimum scheme. I don't get a sense from anyone at this meeting tonight that there's a big swell of support behind the modified do optimum scheme. Mm -hmm. And I think we as now that should be saying that. And I think that, that time scale, given the feedback we've got tonight, is too soon. Well, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Ian, I hear what you're saying, however, the Residents Association to Matt Damon are meeting tomorrow with officers. Um, as I said, on the 15th, that's Thursday, the Residents Association are meeting with the board, and I think it would be precipitate at this stage for this uh, LLF to say what you wish us to say, because it seems to me that what I want to know is from the residents' associations the outcome of the discussions that they and Matt have with the officers. I want to know that, their outcome, before I come to any conclusion about this process. And I want to know what the outcome is of their discussions with the board as well. So I'm in the hands of the LLF, but this is my theory as to the way that we should go, not make some statement at this stage, but at least have feedback from these meetings that are scheduled to take place, but I'm in the hands of the, of the LLF. I, mean, do, do people I, want to I would agree with Councillor Manning. It seems to me that we've, we've seen a presentation of the do optimum with the modifications that have been proposed, but, but it, looks, it looks to me as if what's going to go forward to the Assembly is the modified do optimum, and yet I'm not sure we've 
that's kind of been agreed? Well, I actually yeah. don't know what's being said here because, quite frankly, I am presenting to the Assembly and to the Board the resolutions of this LRF. Yes. Yes. The resolutions of this LRF are not what's being presented here. The resolutions of the LRF are due optimum and that is what I shall be presenting to the Assembly and it's what I shall be presenting to the Board. I shall not be presenting the the modified modification that's been put forward tonight. So I don't really know why this LLF is being asked to say that we disagree with this when it's certainly not what I'm going to be putting to the Assembly or to the Board. But as I say, I'm in the hands of the LLF. So... <laughs> address Ian's yes. point, I think it's a very serious point. I just wonder whether this stakeholder meeting on the 10th of July, is that actually an LLF meeting? Uh, no, my understanding is that it's a stakeholder meeting with public presence, so but it, are you saying you wish something to well, come I'm just saying that would be an opportunity to make a resolution of it. Well, then, if that's the, the, the approach that we're going to take, let's think about that as an approach because by that time we'll have the feedback from you and Matt as to what's happened in the officers meeting and we'll have the feedback from the discussion with the City Deal Board which seems to me to be a much more sensible way to go than to be making some proposition at this stage. So I think we'll end on that note. And I'll say thank you very much to everybody for coming and thank you so much to the officers too uh, for their presentations <coughs> for the time. And now I think we must remove ourselves. Thank you. And thank you. Well